Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Wednesday, September 24th, 2014 edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report. I am your host tonight, Joe Hagman. My co-host and father, Doug Hagman, will not be joining us tonight. He is still battling a very nasty, uh, how did you call it, a, a strep throat type illness, a, a respiratory illness. And he was the same, you know, doing pretty bad Monday. It seemed like it was getting better yesterday where he was able to talk and he was on the show with us. But today it seems to be even worse. So he's going to get his rest and we're going to continue on with our guest tonight, Mr. Greg Jackson. He is a frequent guest of the show, a very good friend of the show. And we always love having him on. Greg is the author of several books. He's a former radio show host. Uh, He still does a lot of radio, Uh, for example, Pastor David Manning's show on Mondays. Um, He is a guest there. But Greg's latest book, 40 Things to Teach Your Children Before You Die. I know we talked a lot about this before it was released, but it was just released last Tuesday, I believe. And we have him with us tonight to talk about not only what's in the book, but um, some other spiritual truths and, and matters pertaining to our spiritual life and the church that are really pivotal Uh, things to talk about right now in an age where uh, Christianity, both in the church and outside of the church, seems to be uh, losing ground to the wills and wants of each individual person rather than what the Lord wants for us. With that, Greg, I'm going to bring you on. It's great to have you back on the show. I appreciate it, Joe. It's always a pleasure, and uh, thoughts and prayers to your father, who I'm sure is listening if he's not taking a nap, but I'm... (laughs) Hopefully he'll regain his strength and get better, and uh, I know all the saints in the audience will be uh, lifting him up and, and praying for his speedy recovery, because he, uh, he he was, you know, I listened to the show last night, <laughs> uh, and I, I could tell that um, he he was uh, definitely fighting something nasty, even though he was able to talk, it probably probably best to, uh, to rest up and get better. Absolutely, and yeah, we do ask for it those prayer warriors in our chat room and in our listening audience to pray for him as uh, his illness is uh, pretty nasty. It's not obviously life-threatening, but we don't want to see him continue to be down for any length of time as he has important work uh, to continue. And another note, uh, we were planning to go to Chicago to the Rust Is Dark Conference this weekend. Starting tomorrow, we were going to leave. We are not going to be able to make that trip. He is too sick and we did not want to take the chance, so we had to cancel our, our reservations today. And I apologize to anybody who, uh, you know, was looking forward to meeting us there. I saw some emails that we received and other messages where people, you know, said, "I can't wait to meet you guys in Chicago." Uh, we're not going to be able to make it, and we do apologize. But we will have another chance sooner than later. And uh, again, we're just continuing to pray for my dad that he does get better. And you never know. Maybe we could make it if uh, he has some kind of miraculous comeback. But anyway, we're going to get into tonight um, some awesome content. I was able and had the pleasure to talk with Greg before the show today uh, a few separate times. And we talked about a lot of of important, uh, spiritually deep things and uh, talked about salvation and how, you know, the salvation of of churchgoers and believers uh, can be in our minds, you know, questioned. It can be manipulated. We can feel unworthy. We talked about different, you know, vices and and sins that uh, us believers go through and how that can be used against us, even though the Lord tells us that, you know, he died for our sins, for our salvation, uh, so that we can be saved. And we deal with a lot of spiritual wickedness and and, uh, dark spiritual... uh, what would you say, uh, persuasions that they, what they do to us in this world is uh, play with our mind. They put thoughts into our mind of, of you know, self-guilt, uh, unworthiness, and we need to, you know, learn how to combat these and see what the Bible says on how to combat these. And also a little bit tonight we're going to get into is the church of uh, the original church and how that looks to, versus the church we see today. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Greg, and uh, you lead us off and, and start where, where you would, with what you want to get into. Well, I think that it's important, you know, when and listening to your past couple of shows and there's a common theme, obviously your your listeners understand the times in which we're living in and and uh, can seem overwhelming at times with with everything that's going on in the news, 
with, uh, you know, ISIS and with, uh, you know, the invasion at the southern border, wars and rumors of wars and all these things that are, that are, that are going on. Uh, I think, you know, people can, even the strongest of believers can get kind of overwhelmed and fatigued at all of the information that's, that's, we seem to be bombarded with on a pretty fairly daily basis. And, you know, with me, I struggle with it personally, too, uh, as, I, as I know you do, as I think we all do, which is that even though we know uh, if we're Christians and we're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, by God's grace alone, that uh, still we know from reading the scriptures that we're going to face trials and tribulations in, in our lifetime. And I think the real, the real challenge for, at least for me, and you and I talked about it today, is you know, how, do we, how do we have a heavenly perspective at the times in which we're living in, and how do we endure? I mean, what does that look like? Because I think that sometimes we can get you know, somewhat schizophrenic, knowing that we're saved, knowing that we're going to go to heaven and spend eternity with the Lord, but by the same token, still kind of get caught up in all of the things that are going on in the world. And I think a big question that a lot of people have on their minds is, and they're conflicted about it, is, hey, if things are only going to continue to get worse, as the Bible says, and as we're seeing, uh, you know, around the world, you know, what what is it that I can do? I, it's, you know, it's kind of, it becomes fatalistic in the sense that, you know, things are just going to uh, deteriorate morally and spiritually and economically and all, you know, in virtually every realm and, and facet of our society. So what is it that we can do? Or, uh, you know, how then shall we live, I guess, as, as, as Christians? How are we to endure? And I think that the theme tonight, at least that I'm hoping, and, you know, my great burden on my heart is to, um, and we'll, we'll talk about 40 things as well, because I think that, that my book kind of fits into it in, in many ways, is answering that question. What is it that we can do as ambassadors of Christ in these last days? How should we live? How should we react to the events around us? How should we deal with wickedness and tyranny in, in government how should we uh, how should we witness to our family and friends? And the thing is, you know, uh, your guest last night hit the the nail on the head, Joe. You know, they're they're starting a pretty amazing. Uh, if people didn't listen to last night's show, I'd highly recommend doing it um, because they're I think living uh, they're living their lives as we should as Christians by uh, not having a fatalistic attitude, but by enduring, by doing what God has called us to do, which is to love yeah. God and to love people, right? Absolutely. And, last and, 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 were, and if we're... Yeah. Yeah. Gary Stearman and Bob Ulrich of Prophecy in the News, and they announced the launching of a new TV series, a uh, TV show called Skynet, and they're going to uh, have a lot more news coverage and interviews with uh, guests that they've had on previously and, and new, newer guests that they want to have on. So they're expanding their operations there in a time when, you know, uh, Bible prophecy and you know, the true word of the Lord is, is basically shunned upon, ignored, and, and all, you know, torn down by all levels. It's great to be able to see a ministry expanding and being able to not only reach more people, but get uh, more people's interpretations who are experts in prophecy and who are studiers of the word. Absolutely, and it's it's exciting, and it inspired me, and it encouraged me. And you know, I, I was reading in the book of Daniel um, today. Um, uh, a good good buddy of mine, where he and I were talking about, you know, how how we as Christians should live, and you know, what's the what's the positive message? Because again, like Paul McGuire always says, Christianity is not fatalistic. Um, you know, we if we know our identity in Christ, we know that God is in control, and as one of your guests said last night, God is never taken by surprise, and that he is sovereign in the affairs of man. He's in, he's in total control, and he has a plan. And 
so I was reading in the book of Daniel in chapter 1, and just to kind of paraphrase it, and, and I would encourage listeners to read Daniel chapter 1 before you go to bed tonight, or you can open up your Bibles if you have one uh, right now, and, and I'll just kind of paraphrase and then get to the key point, because I think it really encompasses and, and you know everything that, that I believe that that is should be most encouraging to Christians and answer the question how we should be living in the times in which we're living. And, you know, in in Daniel's time, it says, uh, you know, in the third year in the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Je- Jeco- uh, Joachim, king of Judah, into the hand, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Azapenaz, the chief of the officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability of serving in the king's court. And he ordered them to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. And this is pretty amazing. So Nebuchadnezzar, right, besieges uh, um, Jerusalem, right, and yet chooses these, these four Jewish boys, we know them as Daniel, and then Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah, whose names were changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it says in verse 9, God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. Because uh, earlier on, Daniel says that they want to refrain. Uh, It says in in verse 8, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. And then yeah. it says, and I'm just kind of skipping around verse 11, but Daniel said to the overseer whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. By the way, that's called the Daniel fast. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. And at the end of ten days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. As for these youths, this is the most important part, verse 17 in Daniel chapter 1, as for these youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days, which he had, which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. That's Daniel chapter 1. I skipped a couple of verses. But here's the main point, um, Doug, which, or Joe, is that, and Doug, if you're listening, (laughs) which is I believe in in reading Daniel chapter 1 that this this is the key. This is how we should live. So 
we live in a in a wicked and evil nation. We are living, I believe, in what the Bible, in many regards, is mystery Babylon. We are we have a a wicked, tyrannical government at virtually every branch and every level of government at the state and federal level, who allows little babies to be murdered, who allows uh, uh, homosexuals to marry one another, who uh, you know, and essentially allowed, rewards, I mean, they, they, they consents to and funds, yeah, celebrates. Yeah. And and so, how are we to live? And really, I think the key is, well, what did Daniel do when he was in a similar situation? Net King Nebuchadnezzar besieging Israel, and yet, what did Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do? Well, they. It, essentially, they came out of Babylon in many ways, and this is what we're called to do, to come out of her. And even though they were there physically, they were still obedient to God. And what did God do? He rewarded them. How did he reward them? Well, it's the Bible says that God holds the hearts of kings in his hand. And, and in that regard, uh, Joe, he gave his supernatural hedge of protection to those Jewish boys who stood on God's word and who were obedient to God, uh, you know, speaking the truth in love and basically, you know, saying, we'll serve the king, but we want to refrain. We want to purify ourselves. We want to keep ourselves clean. So they didn't compromise their core values and beliefs. And in doing so, uh, it, it says that God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. He, may, he gave them godly wisdom to be able to discern the times in which they were living and to navigate safely in them. And this, I believe, is how the Lord wants his people to live in 2014. As the days grow darker, what are we as Christians to do? We could put up our hands and say, well, we're powerless, things are just going to get worse, there's really nothing that we can do, it's just a godless world, or we can use this as an opportunity to glorify the Lord by being obedient to him, even in the little things. We don't, we're not called to, to, I'm not in charge of changing the world, you're not in charge of changing the world, but what we are in charge of is being obedient to God in the, whatever platform he gives us, with whatever he gives us. So for me personally, what do I have at, at, at my control? Well, I can be a good father to my son. That's why I wrote the book, 40 Things to Teach Your Children Before You Die, as an example, because I want to be obedient to the Lord and to teach my son the truth about, well, you know, sp spiritual things, about God's word, about salvation, about right and wrong, about where the law comes from, about what the biblical government looks like, about uh, it, essentially the opposite of everything the world is going to tell them is true. So I think that we have a, a, an, an awesome opportunity. Paul McGuire talks about it every time he's on your guys' show, to tap into that dudamus, that dynamite power. If we know our identities in Christ, we know that, he, that we rule and reign with him in the spiritual realms, that we're seated on thrones spiritually. So if we recognize that, well, then shame on us if we don't tap into it. The only reason, uh, Joe, that, that in the United States of America that it seems as though the, the, the secular humanists, the, the anti-God left, the atheists, are winning the quote-unquote culture war in our country is that the church is largely for for the you know w you know with few exceptions has lost its saltiness we're, we no longer are the preservative we're, we we no longer are that 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 spice that that that's what salt does it preserves and it makes the food taste better right that's why you add salt to your food and yet by not preaching the real gospel in most churches, and we can talk about you know the Osteens and T.D. Jakes and all of the other false prosperity teachers and teaching a, a, a doctrine of demons, another gospel, as it were, as, as Paul calls it in the in the book of Galatians, that you know the church 
it has lost its saltiness. It's lost its savor because, for the most part, we've abnegated our responsibility of preaching the real gospel and the real Jesus and uh, defending the faith and defending sound doctrine and preaching sound doctrine. And that's the reason that we're in the state that we're in. But even though the majority of the American church might be engaged in that, still, the, just like there was in Daniel's day, there is a radical, righteous remnant, the body of Christ, who are still salt and light in a very dark world, who's growing more rotten by the day, that is still preserving some form of orderliness and godliness and righteousness in our society. I say that to encourage listeners who might be feeling alone, that they're the only ones in their family who are standing for righteousness and truth. They're looked at and scorned and ridiculed and mocked by members of their own family and their friends every time they talk about the end times and being prepared physically and spiritually. And uh, They see the handwriting on the wall, but everybody... You know, basically makes fun of them, talk, talking about how they're doom and gloomers and apocalyptic. I know I'm looked at that by many of my family and friends. And it's okay because the fact of the matter is that, you know, how did they treat Noah in Noah's day, Joe? You know, 400 miles away from the nearest body of water, I believe, and Noah's building this ark. <laughs> and they're walking by his house yeah. saying, Noah, dude, what are you doing? There's There's no water anywhere near. And he said, look... This and, 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 and we are in the days, it's, it, they said that before, the Bible says before the, the, the coming of the Son of Man, it will be like in the days of Noah. And this is exactly the days in which we're living in. So I, I bring all this up to encourage the Hagman and Hagman family to continue to occupy to continue to look to Daniel for that example, to be obedient in every opportunity that God gives us the opportunity to do, to be obedient, even though we might be unpopular and frowned upon and mocked and ridiculed. In the end, when we're obedient to God, I, one of the chapters in my book, 40 Things, is one man with God makes a majority, something that I want my son to know. We might not be in the majority of Americans, but when we stand with God, we're always in the majority because God is much bigger than any group of nations or men which come against him. Amen to that. And, you know, the Lord does, you know, things for a reason, puts people in, in different places for uh, his reasons, but his plan will be carried out regardless of who tries to stop it, whatever their spiritual uh, power or agenda is. No matter what the earthly agenda is, his his plan will be par carried out, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. The only thing we can do is is pray and work to be a part of that agenda. And in uh, as far as believers, we this is something that we should strive for. You know, we we should not. Um, it shouldn't be a hard thing where we're constantly uh, seeking to see what it is the Lord wants us to do. We should be willing and obedient to the Lord enough to, to be reading the Bible, to praying to Him regularly, and that will come, He'll, he'll show us uh, from there exactly what we need to Absolutely. do. Absolutely. But so many make well, it a struggle, yeah, I mean, it, you know? In, 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 you know, Psalm 2 says, Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? Which is what we're seeing right now. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. But he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but for me, I have installed my king upon, upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. And he said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask for me, as of me, excuse me, ask of me, and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth, your position, possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall shatter them with earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. 
do homage to the sun. Some versions say kiss the sun, that he not become angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. Let me repeat that. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. Joe, you're exactly right. God is never taken by surprise. He's on the throne. And even though the United Nations and all the other nations and ISIS and all of you know, the, the, the Illuminati and all of the, uh, the powers and principalities above of wickedness and evil, whatever they're scheming, whatever they're plotting, it's going to come to naught. Because Psalm 1 says, but in, in the last verse of Psalm 1, it says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We know how the story ends. Those who are in Christ Jesus will be protected, and we will be able to uh, be light in a very dark world. And I believe that is the time in which we're living here in 2014. Yeah. And we say we know how the story ends. We do know how uh, it ends. But the one thing we don't know is how we fare in that ending. And that's the only thing that we need to to work on while we're here is to make sure that our destination is secure um, because we know that the Lord will win out uh, over any and all spiritual darkness and attempts of uh, those darkness spirits to overthrow his kingdom. We just have to make sure we're on the right side. Uh, the rest of the stuff we don't have to worry about because we know the Lord is and will protect his own and he will do so supernaturally. He will do so in any way which he needs to, but one thing we have to make sure is that we are walking with him for his glory, not for our own self and our own wants and, and needs. Absolutely. You know, if if I could, you know, I've been on your show a few times, and I just wanted to kind of share with listeners, if I could, bef you know, before we get in, into the book a little bit, because I think that there's a lot of good life lessons that and things in, in this short book, book that I've written that, that I think, you know, people can use and 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 share with their children and their friends and their and their family to encourage them and to lead them to the truth. Greg, after we um, talked and you mentioned going through the book and picking out a few chapters to expand on. Yeah. I, after reading through this, the chapters again, I'm thinking I can't really pick which ones I want to talk about. I'd rather just we'll talk just about them all. all. We'll could. just go through all yeah. 40. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that good. And I'm not trying to hype you up or blow smoke. Uh, no. It is that good. And, and it's a, a fantastic work. Well, I, and, 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 and again, I, you know... I have a, a thank, thank the Lord. I've been gainfully employed in in uh, uh, sales for you know past 20 years, 46 years old, and have been tremendously blessed uh, by the Lord. And um, you know, I write books uh, not to make money, but uh, you know, I've, as you mentioned, I, I've written a couple of books: conservative comebacks to liberal lies. Uh, we won't get fooled again, and now 40 things to teach your children before you die. And if every book that I've written, I've done so because it's been a great burden and passion uh, that that I wanted to lay down on paper. And the Lord has 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 honored that, and I know that all of those books have had an impact, uh, and and hopefully in lifting up His name and, and glorifying Him and helping inform and encourage others. Uh, but I, I do want to say, if, if I could just share, if you haven't checked out uh, my latest book, 40 Things to Teach Your Children Before You Die, uh, and the subtitle is The Simple American Truths About Life, Family, and Faith, go to Amazon, and, and you can you can check out, as, as you're listening right now, you can go to Amazon, and, and, and you can preview, and you can look at the table of contents at those 40 things. And, of course, it's not an exhaustive list, um, Joe, because uh, you know, obviously, there's there's some things that you can add to them, but uh, you know, I had uh, the publisher recommended 40 because it's biblical, and also because the list that and 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 my manuscript that I submitted to them was pretty close to it. Um, but I think that there are the most important things as it pertains to life, family, and faith. Um, but just to give listeners a little little bit of background um, on on me and kind of why I wrote the book, if I may. Um, I am a Jewish believer, and I came to faith in 2001, shortly before 9-11. And my story is pretty cool because um, I was living in San Francisco. I had been married for three or four years. 
at the time. And uh, my wife had done very well in the dot, dot com boom in San Francisco in the late 90s. And I was doing well in the medical device industry. And we were traveling the world and, you know, going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Europe and, and, and uh, enjoying the finer things in life. And yet I was very, very empty in many ways and doing a lot of things that I, you know, uh, I'm not proud of, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, recreational drugs and alcohol and uh, viewing pornography and things of that nature. And, you know, to be honest with you, just, you know, living a, a real kind of Greg Jackson centered, uh, you know, pagan lifestyle, very materialistic and very me focused and me centered. And I uh, just got to the point one night um, where, you know, my wife and I were trying to figure out she wanted to quit her job and a very lucrative job and start a family. And I wanted her to continue to <laughs> bring home the bacon and uh, live the high lifestyle that we were living. <laughs> you know, we had a nice place in Pacific Heights in San Francisco and a uh, place in Lake Tahoe and enjoying the good life. And, you know, I, again, I was very self-centered and very materialistic and, and my wife wanted to quit her job and start a family. And which meant that I would have been the sole breadwinner. And of course I wanted to do other things and, it meant me staying in the uh, the the high tech world that I was in, you know, driving from San Francisco to Palo Alto every day, and hating the commute, and really hating what I was doing, but just chasing money. I don't know if you remember back in the late '90s, but it was the dot com millionaire boom, and everybody in San Francisco wanted it was in a startup and had stock options and all that stuff, and I was very much caught up into that. And the bottom line was that uh, one night I came home from work and she told me she wanted to start a family. And I just, you know, I'm not a big crier, but I was just like at kind of at the end of my rope. And I just laid in bed that night and and just just cried out. To, I was never an atheist. I was always, you know, a Jew, very culturally Jewish agnostic, <clears throat> believing that there was a quote unquote higher power. I didn't know that that higher power was the God of the Bible, whose son was Jesus Christ at the time. But the fact of the matter is I, I cried out and just said, help, you know, God help me, you know. I'm, and um, that was probably the, the lowest, one of the lowest points of my life um, in that I was, I was broken. I was at the edge. I knew that the things that I were, was doing was, was not good for me. They weren't fulfilling. I was empty in many ways. And the bottom line was that uh, in the middle of the night, that night, as I cried out to God, he answered me. And I can't explain it other than, Joe, that there was a kind of a supernatural feeling of peace that came over me, that that burden that I was carrying around was lifted off my shoulders, and that I knew um, that very clearly that I needed to provide for my wife and to serve my wife and to love my wife, and that I needed to go back into medical sales, which is what I had done before, and earn a living and um, that that was a blessing in my life that I basically turned my nose up at and was chasing the uh, the, 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 dot, the dot com startup uh, uh, stuff and that was going on in the late 90s and and so I got back into medical sales and literally um, you know some doors opened up and this unbelievable opportunity came my way in Charlotte North Carolina and literally three months later we went from Sodom and Gomorrah in San Francisco to Charlotte, North Carolina, in the Queen City, and uh, all expenses paid, phenomenal job, and be really began a, a new life in many ways. And I was at the YMCA one day, and I was on the treadmill, and this guy was standing next to me, and he was reading this big book. And I said, what are you reading? And he said, the book of Hosea. And I said, the book of who? And he said, it's the Bible. I'm reading uh, the book of Hosea. And we got to talking. Long story short, he invited me to his church, and I went uh, I think it was the very next day, Steel Creek Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I walked in, Joe, and uh, there was probably, I don't know, maybe 800, 1,000 people there. And I was I came a little late. So I was standing back near the soundboard, and my wife was with me. And I remember just hearing the most unbelievable, unbelievably beautiful, moving uh, praise and worship music I had ever heard by this wonderful a black lead singer, female, that was just moving me to tears. And I had no idea why I was crying. Now I know they were tears of joy. But at the time, 
I mean, it was like tears just coming out of just for an hour straight. There wasn't enough tissue on the soundboard behind me to contain my tears. My wife was looking at me like, who's this Jewish guy? Why are we in church and why is he crying? <laughs> and that was it. I, you know, I heard the wow. gospel for the first time and literally, uh, uh, you, you know, repented of my sins and gave my Lord, uh, gave my uh, life to the Lord Jesus placed my faith in him and and uh was baptized and uh you know became a christian in 2001 three months before 911 and that was a high point uh, of of my of my entire life i became a new creation and many of those things joe that i struggled with uh you know i had a foul mouth i was i had an anger problem very self-centered i lied a lot uh not overtly but little white lies um, you know, I, again, a he- fairly heavy partier and drinker and uh, a lot of those things, just most of everything went away. I mean, there were a couple of lingering things, but he took those desires away from me. And the only way I can explain it to people was that it was just a supernatural uh, thing that happened in my life. I, I literally got a new heart and new desires in my life. And I know you can relate to it because I know your story as well. And, uh, you know, certain things lingered, but, you know, the vast majority of the filth and the, and the stuff in my life was removed. And, of course, we all undergo the sanctification process, and hopefully I'm becoming more spiritually uh, pure and, and becoming more Christ-like in my thoughts and my actions and my deeds. Uh, but, you know, we all slip uh, from, from time to time, and then we, we repent and we get right back on our horse and, fight and get on that straight and narrow path. But that has been that was my story, and that was 14 years ago, I guess. And I can only say that um, since that happened, did I lose some friends? Yes, I did. I lost some of my buddies that I used to party with, and I know that they don't come around any longer. And some of them think I'm kind of strange, and that's fine. And but God has given me new friends. Steve Quayle, I think, once said that uh, God will give you better friends uh, for yeah. you than you could ever choose for yourself. <laughs> and that's and what's happened in, right. in my life. And that's so true. Uh, you know, my experience, I was a troublemaker as a kid and, uh, you know, hung around with the wrong crowd. And and uh, just like Steve said, it wasn't until, you know, I started to get serious and things started to change in my life that the Lord put people in there that would be beneficial to me, not try to bring me back down to their level or, or you know, get me to do things that weren't right. And the Lord does know uh, what we need more than more so than we do, and and that, that's echoed in in the New Testament when it says you know don't pray for yourself for the Lord already knows what you need, and He does and He knows how when you need it too, and that's just as important as what you need because you know we could get spiritual gifts and spiritual understandings at a time when we're not fit for for that, and uh, it could be. Uh, uh, completely different in our experience if it wasn't done the way the Lord did it or does it. And we have uh, to thank him for not only knowing what we need and when we need it, but to giving us these gifts, giving us these opportunities and putting us in these positions uh, that change our lives so much. And if with, it was not for him, then we would be in, you know, so much calamity, trouble. And not only that, we would not have the hope that he offers to us because no matter what's going on in the world, and people will say, you know, reporting the news is fear-mongering, and there is a part of sensationalizing news that is fear-mongering. But um, when we see what's going on in the world today, we need a a rock, a foundation of salvation. And without the Lord and his rock, we would all go be going crazy right now. And that's what's keeping us together. That's what's keeping um, the world from falling into utter chaos. Absolutely. Yeah, it says in in the book of Colossians that Christ is all in in all. He's the creator and that he keeps all things together. And that's if we know our identities in Christ, we know that we we're, we're part of the body that you know is that that salt and that light that um is is really the the only uh a reason why things haven't or don't degenerate into total chaos, uh, which will happen when the church is removed, as we know from, uh, you know, studying the um, 
the seven year uh, tribulation um that's found in, in that Daniel talks about as well in the in the book of Daniel and so but here's 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 the good news uh Joe which is that you know one thing i i do know is that god loves me and that he loves me so much that he sent his son to die for me and that i am forgiven of all of my sins that it was his sovereign work that it was nothing that i did that it was you know the bible says in the book of ephesians that we're saved by grace through faith um not of works lest any any man should boast and so when you realize your identity in christ that we that if if you call yourself a christian if you have placed your faith in the lord jesus christ repented of your sins and 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 placed your faith in him then the bible says that you're sealed by the holy spirit and saved and that that no that the devil can never snatch you out of the father's hand matter of fact there's a chapter in my book that i talk talk about that as well and that is the that's the good news and that should be the great encouragement to all of us in these days that the devil wants you to think that oh you messed up you're you're not saved anymore of course this is the the fallacy the false teaching of all of the all of the the the, the false religions in the in, in the world that that teach that you can lose your salvation uh which is not not true when when you are truly saved uh there's that that is a gift that it's a it's a divine gift it's a supernatural gift it's a sovereign gift of the almighty of almighty god that can never be taken away uh and and people that don't right d- uh, rightly divide the word of god fail to distinguish between justification and sanctification we're saved we're justified by christ's finished work on the cross he died for sins and when we trust in him and we place our faith in him we receive his righteousness his propitiation for sins it's a, his righteousness is attributed to us and then when god looks at us he sees his son and that's so important because most people think just because they get off of the and i want to encourage listeners that are maybe they're backslidden some bad behavior uh they're you know falling back into some things that they did that is you know look we we all sin and and if heaven were only for places who uh were were, were nobody committed any but any sins it would be an empty place because we will all continue to sin in our lives but i want to encourage listeners to, Jesus. to know and you and i talked about it today joe yeah we will continue to sin for the rest of our lives. Hopefully it will be less and less and we'll mature spiritually as part of the sanctification process as we're growing in the knowledge of the Lord and who he is. And as we grow in our relationship with him, we'll walk more closely with him and we will become more like him and glorify him and be more of a bright light in a very dark world. But the fact of the matter is I want to encourage your listeners just as much as I want to encourage you and me and anybody else, because we all struggle. You know, the fact of the matter is, when we sin, we're just told to to acknowledge it, to you know, get on our knees and and you know, thank the Lord that He's that we're already covered, that He's already forgiven us, and to just repent of it, and then to acknowledge it, and that when we come clean with the Lord, guess what? We get right back on the we get back right back on our horse, we get right back on that narrow road. Every day is a new day and we don't have to feel the condemnation because condemnation, we're told in the scriptures, is only for those who have not placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They already stand condemned, but for we we who have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus who are saved uh, are not under condemnation. We're not under the law. That's right. And so, uh, if there's and anything that I want to to encourage listeners with tonight is that look look at everybody in the Bible. Look at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, uh, you know, uh, Paul, Daniel. You look at a- anybody, especially Paul, chief among sinners, was a murderer. Uh, persecuted the the first church, and yet the greatest theologian of all time, 
the 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 super apostle the one who uh probably not probably but it did more uh for the growth of the new testament church than any man who's ever set foot on this earth aside from jesus and so we should be encouraged by their example uh that folks were were going to sin and but the the evil one satan himself hasatan uh is the great deceiver the great liar he don't believe his lies that you're condemned that you're you've lost your salvation that you're no good that god doesn't like you god is crazy about you any of you who have children know that regardless of what your kids could ever do you will never stop loving them I know yeah. I'll never stop loving my. I was just telling you today, if my nine-year-old, no matter what he did, I would always take a bullet for him. I would always die for him because I know that when I die, I'm going to be immediately in the loving arms of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we love our kids that much, you don't think God loves us that much more? He's crazy Absolutely. about you. And as you said, this is something that we talked about today. And, uh, you know, we were talking with each other, and I was telling you uh, how it gets discouraging, you know, when we continue to, to sin as believers and, and how that the devil can, can get in your ear and, and put that seed of guiltiness and unworthiness into your mind. And from there, you, you know, let your own mind run away with those thoughts. And before you know it, you've taken yourself out of the grace of God by uh, denying his power. And, and how dangerous of a cycle that can be. And we need to be encouraged by each other. This is why we need fellowship. You know, we don't have to do it in a church building like we see on mm. uh, how it used to be. But we can do it with each other uh, as a group, no matter who you are. Anybody who's a believer in Christ, any two or three together, uh, what does it say? My Holy Spirit will be with you. Uh, if there's two or three of you together in agreement um, in belief in me. And I am we among need you. this more than ever. Well, well, the important thing, Joe, is that, look, um, I think that at this point in, in time that Christians need to really, and starting with me, um, need to take a real honest inventory of where we are at in our spiritual walk because the coming of the Lord, I believe, is near. And I, I don't know if the Lord will tarry, if he will come back in our lifetime, I don't know when. Only the Father knows, the Bible said, which is why I don't get too caught up in eschatology. Of course, it's important, end times, study of end times. But I do know what Jesus said, which is that only the Father knows the day, the day and the hour. And I believe he said that for a reason, so that we would not be too focused. And I, I use the example when you and I talked earlier, you know, when my dad and, and, and mom would, would go out or whatever and leave me with a babysitter or when I would babysit for my sister, you know, I'd say, you know, you know, when are you, when are you, when are you coming home or whatever? And I remember my dad saying to me once, don't worry about when I come home. You just make sure that uh, the, the lawn is mowed and that uh, you've taken care of all of your chores and your homework is done. <laughs> In other words, you, you just, you, you focus on what you need to do and, you know, I'll I'll be home when when I need to be home. In other words, I didn't need to know everything that my parents were doing and 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 everything that uh, you know uh, that was uh, that was going on with them. I was on right. a need to know basis, and I believe that that's I believe how God wants us to operate to to uh, uh, endure, to occupy, to fight for truth and righteousness and justice to be the priests of our home, to teach our children uh, right from wrong, to teach them God's word, to defend sound doctrine, to do all of these things. I mean, let's go back to Daniel again. He's, he's the theme. What did, what did he do? He was just obedient in the area that, that God gave him. He didn't have a national talk show. He didn't have... A, he wasn't a syndicated columnist. He wasn't writing, you know, uh, uh, books. Um, but Daniel, uh, you know, was uh, had a, a, the special privilege of being obedient to God in very difficult times, and God used him mightily. And I want to encourage listeners that wherever you're at, it doesn't matter where you're at in your life or who, what circle or sphere of influence you have, 
it's probably a lot bigger than what you realize with your with our little puny pea brains uh, that compared to God are you know they're just little little pea brains. Yeah. So when we recognize the fact that all He is asking of us is that we're obedient in the little things. When we're obedient in the little things, then He will get He will increase our domain, our territory, and I, I believe that's how that's how the Lord operates. In fact, you you and your dad show it, it's a perfect example. You guys were obedient and not watering down the truth, not watering down the gospel, being obedient to him, be, having a contrite heart and a broken spirit. Um, you know, admitting that hey, listen, we're just two private investigators. We're just trying to get to the truth. And yet God has used your ministry mightily. Why? Because the Lord says it's not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. He's looking for men and women who will be obedient to him, who will be brokenhearted and contrite and, uh, and brokenhearted not only for our, for our own sins, but for you know, the sins of our family members and our friends so that we could lead them to the one who is the solution for all of their problems, Christ our Lord. Amen to that. Chapter 23 of your book, You Are Called to Be a Seed Planner. Uh, this is a, a fantastic message in this chapter because it, uh, what we do on this show, we didn't need a, a license to mm. do it or an invitation. This is something that all believers are called to do, which you said earlier, is, is to spread the, the good news of, of Jesus Christ, and, and that is planting the seeds. We can only plant the seeds. We have to allow the Lord to water them. Uh, in here you say you are not God. Only God's Holy Spirit can ultimately convict a sinner of his sin and in need of, sal- uh, of a Savior. You will encounter many people in your life who desperately need Jesus but who are not saved, and it will make you feel sad at times. I know so many listeners are going through things like this with their family and friends, as you stated earlier, a feeling of loneliness, of, of uh, you know, uh, marginalization, because they have been uh, cast out for their beliefs. And not only that, for trying to warn their fellow family members and friends of their beliefs, they have been you know, called loony or crazy or however it goes. But you go on to say in here, just know that ultimately each individual has to make a decision for himself whether he will accept the free gift of salvation Jesus offers or not or not. Your job is not or is life your job in life isn't to save people, but rather just to let them know that they can be forgiven of their sins and to receive the eternal life by acknowledging their sins and placing their faith in Jesus. So I want to encourage people who have been subjugated or marginalized by their family that no matter what your family and friends have said to you, if you planted that seed, you have done your job for the Lord. You've been an obedient child of the Lord. And that we should take, uh, not pride, but pride through the Lord in that you know we are one with Him and willing to, to spread His understanding to others. And you know even though these people might be mad today, in five, ten years, if we're still around then, something might happen in their life where that's the first thing they remember is what you did for them. And uh, we don't know how many people Amen. could be saved and are saved by our actions that seem to go unthanked and, and sometimes rebuked as we do them. Um, uh, absolutely. And, you know, for people... Um, you know, that you guys have talked about uh, 40 things, and I greatly appreciate it. You know, I wrote the book, 40 Things to Teach Your Children Before You Die. It basically started out, and I want to go to what you just said, Joe, because it's important. But just as a little background, I made a list for my son, who's now nine, and I started a couple of years ago, so he was seven, of things that I wanted him to know if I died prematurely, and that list became a book. And I thought, hey, if if my son could benefit from it, um, I'm going to submit this thing to my publisher, and he said, "Hey, we got to get this thing out because there's, you know, there's 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 parents who need to know these uh, things that you've written down in the book that they can share with their kids, because we're being inundated right now, Joe. We're being bombarded by the world with this spirit of antichrist. The, this everything that we hear is is totally." It, it, it's almost like the lies are coming so fast and furious 
there's, there's, there's barely any truth anymore in any of the mainstream media or society at large in the culture. They're being bombarded with all of these lies that there are many ways to heaven, that there is no such, you know, that all truth is relative, that, um, you know, uh, you're basically good, that it's up to whatever the voter, 51%, the majority of the voters say is legal, is, is legal, uh, that, um, you know, we, we, the book of Genesis is really just metaphorical, it's symbolic, it's not really literally the way God created the heavens and the earth, you know, I mean, that, uh, you know, you shouldn't judge, I mean, how many times are you as a parent, you know, your kids are being bombarded with that, and I'm not condemning parents that send their kids to government schools, but like it or not, this is what they're being taught. They're being taught, they're being steeped in and indoctrinated in the religion of secular humanism, which the Supreme Court has acknowledged is indeed a religion. So if you don't think that your kids are being taught religion 40 hours a week, you know, uh, you know it, they are. They're being taught the religion of humanism. And mm -hmm. it's basically the opposite of everything that is taught in the scriptures. They're being taught that they need to just trust their heart, that they can be anything that they want to be, that, uh, you know, they should have sex, but they should do it, you know, they should, uh, they should do it safely. You know, they're teaching this stuff in school, that they shouldn't be narrow-minded, uh, that, um, you know, that... Uh, you know, Christmas is it's 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 a it's like the winter solstice now. It's just about peace and joy and 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 loving people. Uh, that you know that um, they're they're being indoctrinated in this earth worship of uh, that we're to be worshiping Mother Nature and yes. with this whole false religion of of uh you know global warming which we know is now they've changed it to climate change and of course we know the climate is always changing it's called weather and, and <laughs> harmony with uh, nature know that harmony with nature is the term now for the uh, rights of mother earth uh, uh, and we'll exactly. get into that in, in the second hour because there are scriptures in the bible that talk about the it talks about the queen of heaven which is often people think of it as as Mary being related to the Queen of Heaven, but there's a, a lot more to it than than what is at face value, and we can get into that in the second hour. But um, there are Christi Christianity that has been branched off or broken off on purpose, and, and mainly through paganism and, and Hellenism, that has uh, they've turned pagan worship ceremonies and, and pagan religion into Christianity, and there's. You know, if you were to be in Rome 2,000 years ago versus in America today, what you would see as uh, celebrations and practices of Christian religion today would be all pagan uh, religion back then. And that Absolutely. is a scary thought. Well, maybe what we should do, uh, Joe, in the second hour is let's go through some of the biggest lies that our kids are being taught, and we will refute them. And we'll we'll go through the book, you know. Obviously, not all 40 of them, but we we can go through some of the some of the major ones because hopefully it will equip listeners and inform listeners and uh, be encouraging. And to, and I will share because really I wrote the book 40 Things to leave as a legacy for my son, and hopefully it's something he can live with his leave with his posterity. Be, because I want him to know the truth. I, I don't want him to be lied to. I don't want him to be deceived. And I want to say and this. So maybe you know, in the second hour. It's not Go just ahead, for children. It's not just for children. Uh, my mom no. went to uh, her aunt's funeral in Indiana a couple weeks back, and I I lent her the book to read, and she absolutely loved it. Uh, so much so that she were getting her her own copy. Uh, my mother-in-law also read through it the other day at dinner on Sunday, and she thought it was a fantastic uh, tool. She wanted to get it for her daughter, who has uh, four kids. And, you know, these are adults that are reading this, um, saying that this is, uh, you know, so needed today, and it's not something that's just for a, ch a child. This is uh, great fundamental principles for, for us adults uh, also. Absolutely, and I know we got to go to break, so I'll make this short. But it's funny if you go to Amazon, and it's it's on Amazon. And and look, I, I, I my my great desire in my heart is that 
millions of people would get the book because it's short, it's concise, it gets right to the point on the great issues of the day as it pertains to life and truth and salvation and the most important things I believe I can sh- that I wanted to share with my son that I know that parents uh, will want to share with their kids as the lies, uh, you know, we're bombarded with more and more lies, uh, we're going to need something concise and powerful and I believe that that's what I've written and I hope that people check it out because like you said it's not just for kids although it's great to share share with your children Uh, but if I could before break a a, a woman uh, wrote uh, in on my Amazon page recently um, her name is Cindy Cunningham and she says Greg did an amazing job sharing spiritual truths that all Kids and adults need to be grounded in. Each chapter was clear, simple, and to the point. I loved how Greg began several chapters with the world says, in quotes, reminding us of the influences the world pushes on our children that are opposed to God's best for us. This is an easy read. Many chapters are less than a page long. This would be a great book to give to, to give any family, no matter what age their children are. And that was the response that I was looking for when I wrote the book that that people would have a, a simple, easy to use resource to think clearly and that the next generation and even our generation, Joe, would think biblically and act biblically because really the answer to all of our problems, as uh, Steve Quayle always says, there, there's no, uh, we don't, we do have political problems, but there are no uh, uh, what does spiritual he say? There's solutions. no political solutions to spiritual problems. There's right? no uh, sp- yeah spiritual solutions to political problems. And, 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 and unless we deal with the spiritual issues, unless we rightly divide the Word of God, unless we are teaching the Word of God to our children and sharing the Word of God with our family members and friends, there's really not going to be, in my opinion any real heart change and there's not going to be any real uh, a true revival in individually and then corporately in the church and, and as a nation unless we get back to the basics of what God's word says and if and and so people that say oh I don't get caught up in doctrinal issues and so on and so forth well the bible says just the opposite we are to be as in second timothy uh, which is one of my favorite, and I'll, I'll leave you with this before we go to break. Second Timothy chapter 3, Paul says to Timothy, and he says, uh, You, however, continue in the things you have learned to become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof and correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. And if we're to be equipped for every good work, if we, we need to rightly divide the Word of God, we need to know what the Word of God says, and we need to share it and have it be the basis or foundation for all of the debates and arguments that we have, because if it's not grounded in the Word of God, we'll lose every time. Amen. And the quote you were—we can talk uh, more about it now. We're referring to is there's no political solution to a spiritual problem. I misquoted that. That's right. But yeah, that is uh, so very important. And we will take the top of the hour break right now, folks. You're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Wednesday, September 24th, 2014. Our very special guest is Mr. Greg Jackson. His book is 40 Things to Teach Your Children Before You Die. It is a must-have. Um, you know, I think we're going to do more, me and my father are going to do more to buy up some of these books to be able to give more away uh, to those who aren't able to buy them because it is a tool that people can use to not only teach their children uh, biblical foundations without having to read the Bible. If you were like me, if your kids like I was, you dreaded the Bible when you were younger, never wanted to read it because it seemed so big, so complicated, so overwhelming. But this is a great book to lay a, a foundation that is so needed in today's morally bankrupt and spiritually dead world. And as things continue to get it worse, um, 
people are going to be looking for answers. And the best thing we can do, if we can't help anybody else, we can at least guide our kids in the right direction. And I think that's what we're called to do as believers at the very least. We'll be right back after these short messages. We are going to take your calls in the third hour, I believe, at least in the third hour, maybe sooner. But we'll let you know, so stay with us. After these brief messages, we'll be right back with Greg Jackson and hour number two. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to hour number two on this Wednesday edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report. I am flying solo as host today as my father is battling a terrible throat respiratory illness. We ask you to keep him in his your prayers as he needs to get better soon. Um, and you know when he's not on the show due to illness, he is, is sick because he uh, he will work through just about anything. So... Uh, please keep him in your prayers. We appreciate those prayers, and he should be back in no time. Uh, we're talking with Greg Jackson tonight, author of uh, several books, a radio, former radio show host, and his latest book, 40 Things to Tell Your, to Teach Your Children Before You Die. We were getting into some of the more important aspects of that and why it's important to lay a foundation of faith for your children in these uncertain times we live in, these chaotic times of evil rising to the level that only the prophets could dream of or think of. I know that many people in the Old Testament talked about uh, the horrors that they saw when they were receiving visions, especially Daniel, falling on their face and, and being... Daniel was actually sick for three weeks, I believe it said, could not eat or, or, or do anything because of the way the vision bothered him of the future events that he saw in that vision. So we are in those times, and as time continues to move we continue to get closer to the end and, and things will not get better there will not be a restoration of you know uh, what we would hope for only thing we can hope for is the restoration of the true body of Christ coming out of the churches that teach things contrary to the scripture and become our own underground church affecting real change and converts in the process and this is the hope uh, of what um, the prophet saw and this is what Jesus is calling us to do because if the church is not going to do what it is tasked to do or what it has taken the responsibility to do others must step in and fill in the void fill in the gap or stand in the gap as the Lord said and Greg Jackson is one of the men who's been doing that and doing a fantastic job fighting against uh, many different ideological issues uh, and we're just great and honored to have him as a friend of the show and as a guest. Greg, I'm going to give it back to you here an hour or two and let you begin with where you want to go. Well, we talked in hour one a little bit about you know how we should how we should live and how we are to endure and occupy in these increasingly dark times in which we're living in. And, you know, we talked a little bit before the break um, about this, the book that I wrote for my son because uh, I think that the most valuable thing that, I mean, people often say, well, i got to pray to the Lord, you know, it's so that he can reveal my purpose or whatever. And we each have our own gifts and talents. There's no doubt about it. And we should pray that that the Lord would reveal those things uh, to us in our lives. But we each share... Uh, a, a common uh, purpose, uh, which I believe is our main purpose here on earth, which is to love God and love people and to lead others to him. And, the, you know, in, in the days in which we're living in right now, um, you know, in these in increasingly dark times, I think, you know, we talked about how people can just kind of throw their arms up and say, what can I do? And yet we can be obedient to the Lord and we can stand in the gap. Um, yes. And that's why I wrote the book, 40 Things to Teach Your Children Before You Die, because I want my son to know, I, I want to fulfill my obligation I, as the primary instructor of my child's spiritual and moral upbringing. It's not the pastor of my church. It's not the Sunday school teacher's responsibility primarily. It's not his teacher in his Christian school's primary responsibility. It's me. I have a, a burden and, and, and a, a, a great responsibility, Joe, to teach my nine-year-old the truth uh, to the best of my ability. And, you know, if I could, I, I just want to read uh, Paul McGuire, who's a frequent guest on your show, 
um, endorsed the book and he read it. And he was a great encouragement to me before the book even came out. And with your permission, I just want to read his his short little little sure. blurb. He says, "Your children, your children are a sacred trust from God to you. You have a divine responsibility to import impart in them the truths." that society, media, and the educational system will not teach them. Greg Jackson has identified 40 key truths that parents need to teach their children. Tragically, 9 out of 10 children from evangelical homes walk away from the faith, their faith by the time they enter college. One of the biggest reasons for that is that their parents did not impart in their children a truly biblical worldview. Greg has simplified the process and has prioritized key areas that can transform your children's view of themselves and the world. This book is a very powerful tool for parents to use. I encourage you to get Greg's book and use those tools and watch your child's life become something beautiful and powerful for God. And obviously I'm very thankful. I respect Paul McGuire immensely. And, um, you know, uh, Coach Dave Dobmeyer, is a, who's a, a close friend of mine as well, is a been a guest on your show, I know, and, and, and I think you met him. He wrote, in a time when lies seem to rule the day, Greg Jackson cuts through the fog and crystallizes for us the truths that were once known as common sense. Sadly, today in America, sense is no longer common, but is an opinion. The issues that Greg deals with in his book are essential building blocks upon which we can stand in our efforts to restore sanity to a morally confused nation. And really, I, I chose those two um, in, in endorsements to read because well they're, they're guests on your show and you know them and your listeners know them but also because I, I think they especially Paul does it a better job than I could of really going to the heart of really what this book is, is all about I mean the saddest thing about his endorsement is he says tragically 9 out of 10 children from evangelical homes walk away from their faith by the time they enter college and I know that if you're a parent listening you want nothing more for your kids than to have a solid faith when you're no longer there that they can lean on in the increasingly tumultuous times in which we're living in, that they will know what they believe and why they believe it. And I think if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we think, well, you know, we go to church once a week and I send my, my kid goes to Sunday school and he watches Veggie Tales. So, you know, I think everything's okay. Well, you know, the fact of the matter is, it's it's not enough because when you think about it, you know, most of the kids in our nation, unfortunately, go to these government-run schools, and anything that they might learn for an hour and a half on Sunday is, I think, immediately, uh, you know, uh, torn to shreds with yeah. 40 hours of indoctrination in humanism, in anti-biblical humanism. So if we want to fulfill our primary roles and duties as 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 moms and dads, I believe we have to acknowledge the fact that we, we are, God has given us the primary rule, uh, duty and obligation to be the chief instructors of our, of our children's moral and spiritual upbringing. It's up to us to teach our children God's Word primarily. The church and, the, and, and, and school and wherever else they might be learning God's Word is really supplementary, but it's up to us primarily to do that. And that's why I wrote this book, because I really believe that parents want to be able to have a lot of these conversations with their kids, uh, but just don't know how to enter into them. And I think that that's where the the book really uh, is a powerful tool in enabling to them to do that. So you want to tackle yeah. a couple of these, Joe? Sure, and I just want to say that, you know, in order to be yeah. able to teach our children – uh, you know what the Bible, you know, is saying. When when we read it, we have to have an understanding ourselves. So it's not uh, something we can just try to teach our, our children without having the ability to comprehend it. Uh, you know, our, ourselves. We can't teach them the scripture and what it means if we have no understanding of it or guidance from the Holy Spirit of, of the understanding. So. It's a twofold thing, you know. At the same time, we're Absolutely. we're teaching our children, we're learning ourselves, as we always will learn uh, while reading the Bible. So, yeah, let's get into uh, some of the the points of the of the book and um, go through why they're so important today. 
Well, the, you know, the first one, and we'll go through a few of these, and again, you can go on Amazon, and, and on Amazon, if you type in 40 things to teach your children, you can just go look at the table of contents and follow along. Um, but again, this is a list that I wrote for my son, Jake, things that I want him to know just in case I can't be there if I die prematurely or whatever. He's going to know what dad thought, uh, believed in and valued. Um, and, you know, the, the first thing, chapter one, is seek first the kingdom. And each chapter starts out, Joe, as giving the world's perspective. And I, I start out each chapter by saying the world will tell you because uh, I want him to know these are the things that you're going to hear. Um, you know, I'm real upfront with my son. Hey, you're going to be confronted with evolutionists, and you're going to go to a museum, and you're going to hear about millions and billions of years. You're going to hear all of these things that you're not to judge, that, you know, the, the, that the law is whatever the majority says it is, that the truth is relative. You're going to hear all these things. The world is going to tell you these things because I don't want him to be surprised. So I've been very upfront with my son since he was very young about what the world is going to tell him and I wrote this book so that he would know the truth behind uh, many of these pernicious lies that, the, that, that he's going to be indoctrinated with. And the first chapter, I think, is, is very important. It's called, just to give uh, listeners a taste of the book, it's called Seek First the Kingdom. And it says the world will tell you to look out for number one. I mean, how many times do we hear that, Joe? You've got to look out for number one. And to seek your own happiness in life, but the Bible says the exact opposite. God says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all other things will be added unto you, which is, which is of course, Matthew 6.33. You see, while you may be quite near the center of the universe, you are not the center of the universe. God is. And one of the main reasons he created you is to glorify him through our worship and relationship with him and, by extension, others. God made the universe, the earth, the people, and, and people like us so he could have somebody to talk to, somebody to do things with, and someone to love. He is the most famous and talked about person in all history. The Bible says that God's fame is part of his glory. And when you talk to God and give God his rightful place as, as your leader in life, you bring him even greater glory, and you make him happy. God has promised those who are his children that when we place our faith in him, and make his son Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, he will add everything else that we need in our lives, and that he will give us above and beyond what we could ever imagine. When you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart, Psalm 37, 4, which is one of my favorite verses. And that's it. That's the whole first chapter. Seek first the kingdom. Because, listen, how many times there... Everything that our kids are bombarded with, from iPhones to iPads and i this and i that and i universe and you're the center of your universe and... You know, uh, mo uh, most of the churches, I mean, you, you know, Joel Osteen's basically saying God's not happy unless you are, <laughs> that we worship God to make ourselves happy. It's all about self, 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 right? Our kids yeah. are bombarded with that. But what that leads to is, first of all, they're, they're being deceived, so they're, they're, they're uh, coming to a false understanding of their relationship and, and why they were created. Yeah, go if ahead. If can, I have a 35-second clip of Joel Olstein's wife uh, and, and what you're just yeah, talking about for those who don't understand. This is what Joel Olstein's wife said uh, about doing good for your own self. So I just want to encourage every one of us to realize when we obey God, we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. We're doing it for ourselves because God takes pleasure when we're happy. That's the thing that gives him the greatest joy this morning. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself. Because that's... Huh. So there yeah. you go. Uh, it, one of the main, yeah, most, and most popular preachers, and his wife in the whole country, is stating that you know we're here to have a good time and to do good things for ourselves. Uh, completely contrary, and it's sad to see that in a uh, church that reaches so many. Yeah, it's it, church in quotes. Yes, uh, yeah. it's 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 all about self. If you rewind that and play it again, I don't know how many times she's in thirty second clip. She says self, but it's all about self. And again, there's there, there's probably I'm glad you played that clip, Joe, because there's no better illustration of what I'm talking about. This is 
the uh, false, man-centered, uh, anti-biblical, anti-Christical, quote-unquote, gospel, mm-hmm. false gospel from the pit of hell, that God, whoever Joel and Victoria Osteen's uh, perception of, of God is, which is not the God of the Bible, because the God of the Bible, happiness isn't dependent upon our happiness. Um, and it's not on the we're world not the center either. of the universe. We're Pardon promised me. persecution, we're promised troubles, tribulations, That's and, and we're promised those not to, so we have a terrible life, but to to be to build our character and, and to be vessels that the Lord can shape into, through his will. Yet to teach that we're doing good for ourselves is to be contrary to what the Lord says. I mean, just like the prosperity gospel, just like many other doctrines that are taught out there. Yeah, I don't think Joel Osteen's ministry would do too well right now with Coptic Christians who are getting their heads cut off by the peace-loving uh, Muslims uh, because they refuse to convert to Islam. I don't know how well that would sell to the underground church in China who are being persecuted in all around the world where it's illegal to worship Jesus. So, But, but in America, sadly... Um, Unfortunately, people like Joel Osteen exist because there's many, many millions of people in this country that are self-professing Christians whose hearts are itching to hear the um, who you know. The, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that there will come a time in, in the last days when 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 men will surround themselves with teachers who will teach what their itching ears want to hear. There would be no Joel Osteen's or T.D. Jakes or any of these other false teachers if, in fact, the hearts of the people didn't want to hear it. Right. And the reason that it's, yeah, the, the, the reason that it's so popular, Joe, is that it's man-centered. It's all about you, and it's in a very appealing message that it's all about self. It's all about how God can bless you, which, of course, God can bless you, um, but not in the way in which the Osteens and these other f- prosperity teachers teach. And so that's one of the main reasons that, <laughs> because that's unfortunately the predominant view of many, many churches in this country, uh, which have been in- infiltrated, I believe, uh, by, uh, you know, by satanic forces who are trying to, you know, disguised as spiritual people who are t- who are working within the churches to deceive the people, uh, you know, propagating this false gospel about this false Jesus uh, with the intention of leading them to hell. And people may say, oh, well, no, the, you know, Joel, you know, he just doesn't choose. That's What did he say? This, that's not my lane. I like to, you know, that's why I don't yeah. preach against homosexuality and abortion and all those things. And well, yet, you know, we're told like, that we're supposed. Go ahead. Well, you, like you said in Second Timothy chapter four, verse three, it says, "For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts will they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away yes. their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned into fables." And in there, I, I see that they will turn away their, uh, move away from sound doctrine, and move, go after their own lusts to heap together teachers yes. for themselves, uh, turning away their ears from the truth, they shall be turned into fables. And it goes on to say that these you know, people will begin by being seduced and they will eventually uh, be deceived so much they'll turn into deceivers themselves. themselves. Um, yeah. yeah, and then Paul, and Paul says to Timothy in verse 5, But you be sober in all things and endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And then he says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith in the future. There is laid for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And I want my son to know that he was created not to be the center of the universe, but to glorify God and to point others to him, to have a relationship with his Heavenly Father. And so that's why I started the book off with Seek First the the Kingdom. Um, yeah. 
chapter 2, if I could just skip to it, you were created by God. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but, you know, the world is, what's the world telling our kids, Joe? What, where would, we where were, did they come from? Who created We them? evolved from monkeys. We first came from a, a Big <laughs> Bang. Right. Uh, the universe was created by the Big Bang, and and eventually we became we became plants and the rocks and the trees and the monkeys and the people. And the, the yeah. th- theory of evolution is what they teach. Well, exactly right. And, and, and this is what your kids are being taught in the government schools. But I, and I say, you know, it's quite simply, it's one of my shortest chapters. The world will tell you that you're nothing more than matter and energy and that you evolved from animals. You are not an animal, nor did you evolve from one. God created the heavens and the earth and created the first human, Adam, on the sixth day of creation week. God created you in his very image, and you are totally distinct from any other person ever to inhabit the earth. And then Correct. I quote uh, Genesis one one twenty seven. So God created mankind in His own image, in the image of God He created them, male and female. He created them. He also knew you before anyone else would see you or ever knew you were alive. And I quote uh, Jeremiah one five: Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Don't ever doubt that God made you and loves you so much that He put on human flesh and came in the earth to die for you. You are his child. And then I, I end with Psalm 139. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Now, Joe, if that were taught, that took me about 30 seconds to read. You were created by God. That used to be taught in our schools. Did you know that? We used to have oh, yeah. prayer and yeah. God's word. And, 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 and we didn't have death. We didn't have shootings. We didn't have people blowing themselves up. Uh, but I, I think it, I think it was um, one of the great theologians, um, forgetting his name, of the 19th century, who said that if we remove the scriptures from our schools, they will be become gates of hell, and that's what we've seen when you when you take God's word out. So, in other words. The, the fact, it saddens me that in most, and again, I'm not picking on parents that for whatever reason they send their parent, their, their kids, I'm not condemning you, if you send your kids to a public school, you know, I, I think the best thing to do is homeschool or send your, your child to a, a good Christian school where the Word of God is being taught, but again, I'm not condemning you. It's part of the reason I wrote my book, so that you could at least give them the other side of the story. How sad does it make you, Joe? that kids who go to public schools are intentionally deprived of hearing what I just read, that they didn't evolve from monkeys, that it's evolution was a joke, to evolu- that the whole theory of evolution was a joke, which even Darwin recognized before his death, that it's not scientific, that it's contrary to the, the second law of thermodynamics, uh, that there's never been any missing links or or intermediate fossil evidence that there's 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 absolutely no fossil evidence substantiating evolution, and that they were created. Think about the, how how sad it is that our kids aren't taught that God made them in in our schools, that God made them, and that ma- He made them in His very image, and that He loves them, and that He ma- and that He knew them before they were even born. Yeah, you think if it, our kids knew hor- that horrible that, that that's not even it, it, in it, mentioned. It's horrible, and again, that's what I want my now. My son fortunately goes to a good Christian school, and they actually read the manuscript of, and they carry it in their Christian bookstore, and I'm very thankful. But I'm hoping that parents who maybe they feel like, what can I do with my kids? They're being indoctrinated. Here's your answer: forty things to teach your children before you die. And I say that because I have a heart, you know, having taught Sunday school since my son was three or four years old, I have a heart for the next generation and a heart for children that they would know the truth, that they wouldn't be deceived, that they wouldn't be lied to, that they would know that they didn't evolve from monks, monkeys or apes, that they could trust God's uh, account of creation in the book of Genesis, that the Bible is God's truth, that it can be, that it's the greatest seller of all time for a reason, and that, it's, you know, that, that it lines up with what we know about science, you know, that w- with the scientific evidence and cosmology and astronomy and all of the other uh, uh, um, areas of, 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 of education. Yeah. And so I have a great burden on my heart for my son to know these things. 
um, that he was created by God, that the Bible is God's truth, that that Jesus is the only way to heaven. I mean, how many times, well, first of all, they, as you said, Joe, I think earlier, schools, most of them don't even say the Pledge of Allegiance. You can't say under God anymore. You're, 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 you're told if you're the valedictorian, like there was a valedictorian speaker, and I think it was Georgia who said you can't uh, deliver your valedictorian speech in, in, in Jesus' name, which he did anyway. Praise God that he did. Yeah. Um, but 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 uh, you know, they say that they're secular and that they don't teach religion, but they are. They're teaching the religion of humanism, which is man-centered. That teaches moral relativism. That we evolve from monkeys. Uh, that uh, essentially communism is the is the answer to all of our economic woes. Yep. Um, that there are no such thing as, as as distinct male and female roles that or the natural human family. So they are teaching everything opposite of the Bible, and I wanted my son to know that Jesus is the only way to heaven, and that's chapter 4. Because how many times are our kids told, Joe, that there are many ways to heaven? It's the Oprah Winfrey gospel. But I wanted my little Jake to know that, uh, and let me, let me just read it one more, and then I'll let you, let you respond. It says, the world will say that there are many roads to heaven, and that all religions are basically the same. I'm sure everybody's seen those those coexist bumper stickers, right? They will claim that if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you will end up in heaven if they even believe that such a place exists. The Bible, however, says the exact opposite. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. Faith alone, in Christ alone, by God's grace alone, is the only way to have your sins forgiven and be granted eternal life in heaven. God loves you so much that he made it explicitly clear in the scriptures so we would not be confused because God is not the author of confusion, but there is but one way to heaven through faith in Jesus alone. That's the whole Amen. chapter, chapter 4. Jesus is the only way to heaven. And if we could just sit down at our kitchen tables and say, son, daughter, um, you know, you, the world says there are many roads to heaven. I'm here to tell you, that's a lie. <laughs> imagine yeah. imagine if the kids heard that message at a young age, and then they could do a Bible study, uh, you know, because, again, this, this book is no substitute for the Bible because this book was written to, to share God's Word with people, to lead them to a more in-depth study of God's Word. Let me yeah. be clear about that. But but it was fully intended to make make people zealous for the truth and hungry for the word. And the United Nations, who is the spearhead between uh, the one world religious, one world economic, one world political system, and through their tentacles or branches from the IMF to World Bank to the World Health Organization, they have been implementing a agenda to uh, bring this new world order, one world order, about. And they have new documents mm. that they've released. Um, you know, they have a global compact that they've released. They have released their um, goodness, their ten planks of uh, or ten pillars of civilization, which is you know a mock of the Ten Commandments. We already have the Ten Commandments that were ordained by God, given to to Moses. Why do we need to change them? You know, basically they're they're saying some of the same things only they're leaving out uh, the lord and and to evolution you know energy from science even science says that energy cannot be created nor destroyed so the notion that the big bang theory uh, created energy and this is the reason why we're all here they have no answer to how energy was created but they know it can't be destroyed they're but they have to uh, push away from intelligent design, otherwise it ruins their plans for their coming Messiah. And when I say their coming Messiah, they are expecting a Messiah. They are teaching people who don't believe in the Lord to expect a coming world Messiah. The, there are Jewish people who still believe the Messiah is still coming. The, is, uh, Muslims, many, many believe there is a Messiah still coming. And they are grooming the world for a coming Messiah, which we know as the coming Antichrist and the Great Deception. Amen. And they, yes. the UN even even implemented or issued a declaration of rights of Mother Earth, uh, uh, listing Mother Earth as a living being, giving Mother Earth inherent rights, uh, 
<laughs> which are more rights than what they give you know human beings as they uh, call us cattle but they state that we need to pledge our, our worship and our allegiance to mother earth to live in harmony with nature otherwise we will not be able to reap the benefits of their new society or community uh, that is associated with this Mother Earth. And this could just be the, the agenda of the day. I know it changes often uh, with you know through the Lucius Trust and many other UN uh, agendas. But what they want to do is, in every way possible, leave Jesus as the, uh, you know, they don't even want his name to be said or seen. They want to create a hundred million different ways they say you can get to heaven except for the one true way which is jesus which really bothers me and i don't understand why going i mean i do understand but from a from a dark spiritual level from the level of satan why he would want to do that but how and why humans would go to through so many uh lengths to try to remove themselves from uh, jesus at the same time uh Make the uh, put themselves to be a part of uh, uh, heaven in the afterlife. It's mind-boggling. Well, it is. In Romans chapter one, Paul goes to the heart of the matter, and he answers the question as to why we're seeing this. He says, "For an, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in Him, for in it." The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though, who, though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish hearts was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And that's exactly, I think, what you're talking about. You're talking about the spirit of Antichrist, whether it's at the United Nations, whether it's in the highest levels of our government in the White House. Um, essentially, you know, most of the, of the, well, not most, but the Muslim world, this is all part of the same spirit of Antichrist that the scriptures say would be prevalent in the last days. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we see this because, again, what will what does the Bible say that the last days prior to the the coming of the Son of Man be like? It will be like in the days of Noah. And if memory serves, there were only eight people that were saved, <laughs> right? Yep. Um, and that it would be that wicked, and that's how wicked it's going to be. It's going to be like in the days of Noah. But the good news is that we who are the are the remnant can be like Daniel. And I started the show talking about how Daniel was obedient to the Lord and he blessed it. And when we're obedient to him, even though the vast majority, and Jesus says, and remember, I, you know, one of the chapters in my book is, you're to be narrow-minded, right? Because, you know, how many times are our, our kids told and we're told that you shouldn't be so narrow-minded and, you know, you should be more, more open-minded and more tolerant. And yet Jesus said just the opposite. He's called us to be narrow-minded, which is why that's used to bludgeon us uh, Christians most of the time, that we're so narrow-minded. And Well, that's because Jesus has told us to be narrow-minded. Um, yeah. And I'm trying to, to, to see what chapter that is in, in the book, but uh, essentially... Um, you know, Jesus says that uh, it's, it's actually chapter 22, which is on page 45, and Jesus says specifically, 
um, you know, the, the world uh, will say that you should be not be narrow-minded and that you must be tolerant of all beliefs, I say in my book, because there isn't just one right way. Everybody has to decide for themselves what is right, but God says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many will enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few will find it. Matthew 7, 13, and 14. God's word alone is the basis for all truth, I write. You may be ridiculed or even persecuted for basing your values, beliefs, and decisions in life firmly on God's authoritative and inerrant word, but remember that the one true God has called you to be narrow-minded and to enter through the narrow gate, Jesus himself. So that's what we're seeing right now. The whole world... The whole world is saying, "Be we need to create a one world order. We need to have a one world religion, which I apparently the Pope is going to be part of, and um, that we need to have a one world bank." And 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 you know that is the spirit of Antichrist. The the U uh, two song one. Uh, it's the it's the logo for and um, uh, you know for for Nike is one, and w- our kids are taught that they need to be good global citizens. Right, that is the zeitgeist. That is the spirit of the culture and the day in which we're living. It's the spirit of antichrist, and yet Jesus says the exact opposite. That 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 uh, there's only one way to heaven. It's through Him, and those that are uh, whose hearts are hardened, who are in rebellion to God, do not want to hear that. And yet, That's right. we as the the remnant of believers have an obligation to teach our children. And to share with our friends and loved ones, if we really love our neighbor as ourselves, that there is only one true way. And thank God there is, because if there were a million roads, we wouldn't know which one to take. We'd be confused. But we know that God is not the author of confusion. Remember, what did he give Daniel? He gave him wisdom and discernment. And so if we have a personal relationship with the living God through his son, Jesus Christ, and he will give us that discernment. We can tap into that deutimous power that Paul McGuire talks about on your show. And we can we can be clear-headed, level-headed, and discerning in the times in which we're living in. And when, we, when we're discerning and level-headed and not confused, then we're going to have that, surpe- that, that peace, that shalom, that surpasses all understanding which is what God wants us to have. He wants us to be at peace and not to be anxious. Absolutely. In Isaiah 45:18, it says, For thus saith mm-hmm. the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. And another verse goes on to say mm-hmm. uh, that... By for him, for by him, Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consistent. Colossians just, one, you know, two verses uh, right there that uh, the authority of the Lord. States he created everything into existence and he created it to be inhabited and we are the inhabitants of the earth but we have uh, Satan now who has had his fall from heaven and he took some of the angels with him the fallen angels and being a, a, a the evil egomaniac that is trying to deceive as many as he can because he has been deceived and he wants you know, what is it called you know mercy uh, loves company. Um, mm. He is going to use all of his uh, abilities to uh, infect the human mind with as many different theories and, and motives and thoughts uh, contrary to the Lord as possible. And that's what he wants. The Satan wants us is to be lost, is to be uh, weary, to have the foundation based on teachings from our fathers, not as it says in Isaiah about the building the precepts upon precepts, line upon line, here a little, there a little, uh, the Lord's precepts uh, being referred to. And this is done through, um, you know, laziness in our church, you know, people who don't have the motivation or the dedication to to 
search the scriptures for themselves. It's done also by uh, the power of temptation and lust and, and kind of an instant gratification. Uh, also popularity, you know, we see a lot of children today, and I was one of those children who thought it was cool to do this and that, only to come to find out that what I was doing, uh, even though it seemed, you know, harmless, it was evil. And this is how, I mean, there's so many, as you said, the the way uh, to, Jesus is the way, and, and the way to heaven is very narrow if you find it. Well, who are those few that find it, and why are so many lost? We have to understand that we cannot be one of the ones that are lost. We have to find our way, and we have to find the narrow way. And the narrow way means being narrow-minded, being not narrow-minded in a sense that you're not willing to learn or be corrected, but narrow-minded in a sense that we understand that the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, is our Savior. The Holy Spirit gives us correction, and that focus, we grow from there and don't waver from that foundation. But yet, so many look for, uh, you know, easier ways to, to get out of things in their mind. Their, our minds and our human nature are our worst enemies. It's contrary to what the Spirit uh, is. And if we give in to the temptations of our mind, if we're not spiritually based, then we are vulnerable and be able. To, the devil's able to come and devour us, as it says. Absolutely. You know, the, the, the bottom line is that God gave us his divinely revealed word for a reason. And, you know, when people euphemistically have referred to the Bible as basic instructions before leaving uh, life, or before leaving, wait, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth, excuse me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's how I've explained it to, you know, my Sunday school classes and so, you know, it, it's, you know, if you think back to the garden, Joe, what was the first thing that the serpent did to deceive Eve? Well, he took God's word and he distorted it. Is that what yeah. really what God said? He made Eve doubt God's word. And that is what brought in the first sin, right? That's, that that, le- that w- was was what led to the fall in the first place. And the fact of the matter is we're really not in any different place today, 2014, than we were, uh, you know, that, that, that Eve was in the garden, deceived by the serpent, um, w- when we are obedient to, to the Lord. And when we follow his word and we place our faith in it, then we're blessed in our life. When we reject it and we rebel against it, as our nation has done, well, the, the, there has to be a penalty for that. And that's what we're, I think, experiencing in our country. We, we rejected God's authority, the authority of divinely revealed Scripture, which was the basis for uh, the founding of this country and our laws. And when I say the founding, I'm talking about not 230 years ago, but 400 years ago, about 400 years ago when the Puritans and Pilgrims came uh, to this country that we would be a shining city on a hill, that we would, that we would be a, a, a nation that could openly uh, uh, worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I'm not talking about freedom religion of, of religion. I'm talking about a nation that was founded uh, originally uh, in reverence uh, to um, and, and worship of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so again, that's you know we're seeing we're seeing a massive turning away and rejection of God's authoritative, infallible Word, and that's why we're experiencing the problems that we are. Yet the good news is that, like you said, we can grow closer to the Lord as we. Uh, pour more of our, our of our time and our energy into reading His Word and communing in communing with Him in prayer, and uh, we can live a more abundant life here and have healthier relationships when we share His Word with others that we love. And right. again, that's and, you know and, why why I wrote the book. Satan has has been able to 
in a sense, paralyze the Christians out there uh, by the, mm. the amount of, uh, you know, changes and, and, and things that are happening in the earth. But this is one of his, his goals. We, we must never allow ourselves to uh, forget our primary mission, which is to win souls to Christ. And never also, um, we're also called mm. to know the devices of Satan, but at the same time, we cannot let the devices of Satan and how that's playing out in our world be the uh, consumption of our thoughts. The greater point is to focus on the Lord and win souls to the Lord. We need to use and learn how to use through prayer, and, and the Lord will put it in our lives uh, if it's what he wants to, us to do for him, is how to use the devices of Satan, how to recognize them and use it to teach the Lord's word uh, in all the darkness. And, you know, I see so many people that do this in, in a great way. They take the, the chaos that we see in the world today. They take the devices of Satan, you know, whether it's the spreading of the homosexual agenda into churches, and they use it, it's used to wake people up, to, to get the Christians, um, you know, out of Babylon, where it says, come out of her, my people. So it does serve a purpose as uh, hard as it is to watch, as hard as it is to, to, to sit there and, and see happen. It does serve a purpose. It wakes up those people who are, um, you know, maybe on the fence or, or who have been paying attention and reading and just haven't put it together yet. But when they see something like the homosexual agenda being accepted in their church, they say, well, this is what I just read is going to happen in the last days about the uh, how humanity is going to continue to decrease and accept doctrines that were completely contrary to anything Jesus preached. So it does serve a purpose as as bad as it as it is and as it sounds and seems. Absolutely. Well, hopefully, and, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say we have a, about four minutes, three minutes before the top of the hour break. Uh, I want to give out the number for those who want to call in. Uh, that is six six one two four four nine eight three nine six six one two four four nine eight three nine. You can call in and talk with Greg and myself about his book, uh, anything in his book, or anything else that's on your mind uh, pertaining to the church, spirituality, the Lord, salvation, uh, any questions, testimonies, criticisms. We are welcome and open and want to hear from you. So make sure you give us a call if you want to get on board and, and talk to Greg. Uh, we'll be taking callers throughout the whole next hour. And is there anything you want to say uh, this hour before we close it out, Greg? No, I was just going to say an, enough of 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 of, of me uh, <laughs> uh, talking. I, I'd love <laughs> to hear from your listeners. I've always, you know, as a listener myself, I listen to your show every day. That and it's just an honor uh, anytime I have the opportunity to come on with you and your dad because I think the world of you guys and I, I love you guys. Love your audience. I think this you guys are just such a blessing, Joe. That um, you know, really, it just it's it's awesome to be part of it. And I know from listening that you guys have the best listeners. End of story, case closed of any radio show that I've ever heard. And so I can't wait to uh, to talk to to some of your great call, uh, listeners when we come back from the break. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we are so blessed uh, with our listenership. It is, um, you know, beyond anything we could have ever asked for or imagined. Uh, our listeners are fantastic, and they're from all across the globe. Uh, and every time we receive emails and uh, you know letters or messages stating that our show has helped them or helped the neighbor or helped the friend, it's so humbling and and uh, it brings a smile to my face, makes my day. Anytime I'm having a rough time I, I like to go read my email and um, I, I'm never short of finding a, a uh, email that is complimentary or, or, or thanking me and uh, you know it just makes makes it all that much better and uh, you know without the audience we we would be nowhere and we thank you guys for that and with that we're going to go to our top of the hour break we'll be right back after these short messages you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman report on this Wednesday September 24th 2014 I'm flying solo today as my father is ill with a terrible uh, strep-like illness. And we ask that you pray for him and his recovery as uh, we have to put off our Chicago trip due to he how sick he is. Which is, Ladies and gentlemen, to our third and final hour this Wednesday, September 24th edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report, our guest 
for the show has been Mr. Greg Jackson. He is an author, former radio show host, um, and just a great guy all around. I want to let you guys know we're taking phone calls this hour, in case you missed it. The phone number is 661-244-9839. That's 661-244-9839. And if you guys don't start calling in, we'll call you. I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) But with that, uh, is there anything, Greg, you want to get into or state before we get into phone calls? Uh, no, I, I probably let's let's get right to the calls. I'm sure we have a full board. We'll just get yes, get right we, to uh, it. I haven't looked, but I am assuming the same that we do have a number of calls. So let's jump right in. We're going to start with area code eight six two eight six two. We're coming to you first. Thanks for holding. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report with Greg Jackson. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, yes. Yes. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, brothers, um, I love you guys. Listen to you every night. Um, and 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 uh, brother Greg, love you too. Uh, I just want to remind you who I am. It might give you a little chuckle. Remember, um, Doug. Uh, you know, um, Joe. Uh, a while back, uh, a lady had called you and said she wasn't feeling any love about what Pastor Langford had said, and I called in with a passionate defense of him not watering down his his preaching? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Well, I'm that same, that, that same sister, okay? okay. Um, and what I'm about to say, I must preface it, because... Um, you know, but the Bible says he doesn't like the one thing God hates. One of the things God hates is when brethren shows contention amongst the brethren, to show contention. And I'm not doing that. And I, I, I ask you in the name of the Lord not to think that what I'm about to say is doing that. But when I hear something that is flat out wrong, I have to. I mean, I'm compelled in my spirit to just say, Give me a, a further explanation of your understanding, because clearly there's something that's not being understood. Brother Jackson, you said two things that were flat out wrong according to the King James Bible, okay? Mm-hmm. One, you said, we, you said salvation is sovereign and you can't lose it. And mm-hmm. you also said that when we sin... Acknowledge the sin, and mm-hmm. after acknowledging well, it, basically pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and start all over again. Okay, that's paraphrasing. No. And yes, now let's go to the first one. When you said that you can't lose your salvation, mm-hmm. it, it is true. No one can pluck you out of the palm of God's hand, but you can climb out. You can be enticed out. You can be tricked out. You can lose your salvation. And with you telling people, it's basically that once saved, always saved doctrine that has no scriptural foundation. It has none. Because Paul said he must keep unto himself unless after all the people, I'm paraphrasing, after all the preaching he did to people, he would be a castaway. And, and caller, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna put you on hold for a second, and we're gonna address your first question, and then I'll bring you back. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. All right. Thanks. All right, Greg. Last time you were on, we actually talked about this a little bit. Um, I had the same sure. sentiment that the caller did. Uh, you know, it does say in Peter that it is better for somebody to not know the way of righteousness than to know the way of righteousness and to step outside of that. Um, and you gave an explanation that actually had me researching and, and looking and uh, a better understanding. So, if you do remember what you if you remember what you said to me, yeah, uh, if you can get into that. Well, the key thing is to know righteousness. It's uh, so when that scripture and there's also another scripture from from Hebrews that that deals with that as well. But I contend that if we're going to we're going to clearly uh, separate the Word of God, and if we're going to 
read scripture in light of other scripture, rightly dividing the word of God in context and clearly exegeting uh, the scriptures that, you know, that the, the verse from Peter, I would contend, based on my understanding of the scriptures, is that, that uh, uh, Peter is not talking about someone who is saved, but somebody who had a, an understanding or recognition of who Jesus was. And there are many of those people today. They know about Jesus. As a matter of fact, the devil even believes in Jesus. Uh, unbelievers believe that he's the, 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 the Messiah. Uh, some believers do, anyway. But they haven't repented of their sins and placed their faith in him. They haven't made him their Lord and Savior. And are therefore not sealed by the Holy Spirit and, and saved. And my understanding of the scriptures if, is that, and I think probably the, the strongest um, I think probably the strongest scriptures uh, is Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It is by grace you are saved by faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. So it's clear that it's a sovereign work of God. It, it says right here, it's by grace. In other words, it's a free gift. It's not by works. It's not by anything that we earn. It's by the work that was done on, at the cross in Calvary, it was a sovereign work of God, and that clear. And, and that furthermore, in John 10, verse 27 through 30, Jesus says, "My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all." And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So I would contend that when you read the scriptures and you read the words of Jesus himself, he himself explicitly says that he gives his sheep eternal life. And those that he gives eternal life, which we know is by grace through faith alone, not by works lest any man should boast, Jesus explicitly says in John 10, verse 27, will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus, my, her, the caller, respectfully caller, um, my, it, it's not with me, it's with the Word of God. And the King James uh, Version of the Bible says exactly what I've just written. It's the, the wording is no different. Jesus promises us, and so the question is, if somebody were to, let's say they claim to be a Christian, and yet they go and murder somebody, well, my question is, and, and somebody will say, well, does that person lose their salvation? Well, my question is, uh, Joe and caller, did that, was that person really authentically saved in the first place? There are a lot of false converts. I know... Uh, a close a friend of mine who has a, a, a national radio show, his name is Brandon House, who, um, who probably a lot of your listeners are familiar with, was admittedly a false convert for many years of his life. There are many, uh, you know, people who think that just because they got a little water sprinkled on their, on their head when they were a baby, that they became a Christian. Uh, that, that never repented of their sins and placed their faith in Christ and were never actually born again. And so, to the, you know, I respectfully disagree with the caller. And by the way, this book was endorsed by uh, the, the head of the D. James Kennedy Institute for Christianity and Culture, Michael Milton, who's one of the most foremost theologians of our day and the fourth president and chancellor of the Reformed Theological Seminary, and he wrote a glowing review of the, of the book, and uh, as did Dr. R.C. Sproul, Jr., who's a professor of Reformation Bible College, and you know a man that I greatly respect. These are leading theologians, um, and Ray and, Comfort, who you know is the way of the master, wrote the foreword for the book. These are all men, and I have. 
uh, you know, pastors who, and, you know, I know that, you know, people can, can disagree about doctrinal issues and still be brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so I would say that I respectfully disagree, but my understanding of the scriptures, if we're going to rightly divide the word of God, is that I believe that if you are authentically saved, the Bible says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, and Jesus himself says that once you are saved, right, through faith alone and Christ alone, by God's grace alone, not by works, lest any man should boast, that no one, no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. So I respectfully disagree with the caller on that. And before we bring the caller back on, I, I want to state yeah. what my uh, misunderstanding when reading, you know, Second Peter was about, you know, better if they had... Uh, Which verse was escaped. that too, Joe? Second Peter? Second Peter chapter 2, 20. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it talks about, you know, knowing the way of righteousness but turning away from them, and it refers to it as mm -hmm. turning the dog turning back to its own vomit. No, I, I had the same sentiments as a caller had, and I understand what you're saying, that the Lord has predestined those who he will have saved from the beginning of the world. And there is a difference between having the knowledge of the Lord and his ways mm -hmm. versus having the belief of the Lord in his ways. Now, and also when we're talking about once saved, always saved, we're not talking about being saved and then going and living recklessly any way we want to, never, uh, you know, uh, concerning ourselves with spirituality again. That is somebody who is never saved. We're talking about people who are saved, who are constantly working toward a, uh, uh, to better themselves for the Lord and not, uh, you know, backsliding to the point where, you know, they're not going to go get saved and then, you know, run around and start a, a, a devil worship cult. These are the people that, um, who have understood the knowledge and the evils of the world, understood the salvation through the Lord, yet, even with that understanding, chose to turn away from it instead of mm -hmm. embracing the Lord's gift of salvation. And so the, when when we say once saved, always saved, it's not a, a license to uh, you know live in any abominable way you want if you think you're saved. It is a matter of the heart and how we feel about the Lord and how uh, dedicated we are to the Lord. Now, with that, if it's okay, I'm going to bring the caller well, back on well, for... Yeah, but before we bring the caller back on, I just want to make one quick comment. You, you said it was Second Peter chapter 2? Yeah, verse 20. Ver, ver, verse 20. So I want to make a quick comment uh, before we bring caller back on. But it, it says, um, it, well, well, two things. One is there needs to be a clear distinction between, and I talked about it earlier in the program, between justification and sanctification. Uh, false religions teach that you're saved, like, for example, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that you're saved by placing your faith in Jesus and But then to maintain that salvation, you have to do concomitant or simultaneous works of, of penance uh, and, and, um, and, and sacraments to maintain that salvation. And so it's a co-redemptive process, and any of the false religions teach very similar things, which is that uh, it's Jesus plus whatever it is with the you know the the Mormon church or the Jehovah's witnesses or whatever false uh religious systems that are out there always teach that su the sufficiency of Christ's death on the cross at Sal at, at Calvary was not sufficient uh, uh for your salvation they teach that that there's always something that the Catholic church teaches that you can lose your salvation and that it's a co-redemptive process and that that essentially Christ's death on the cross and placing our faith in him alone by God's grace alone was not sufficient and is not sufficient, which is a false gospel. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't Catholics that aren't saved, that are saved in spite of the false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. But what I am saying is that, uh, you know, you, you said um, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, and, they, and, and Peter says, um, in that, he says, uh, uh, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they once again entangled in them and overcome, 
the last state has become worse than for the first, for it is better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed unto them. And so what my understanding of that scripture is that they were never saved in the first place. They had an idea, they had the knowledge of who Jesus was, but they never placed their faith in him because when we do and when we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, God gives us the faith. He increases our faith and he enables us to live a life even though we're going to continue to sin, but that it, it'll be, and you can look in First John for all of the characteristics of a true Born again believer that is going to be a life that is going to be have a consistent pattern of righteousness, which is why Jesus said, "By their fruits you will know them." You want to know who the, uh, uh, an authentically saved person is? Don't judge them by what they say. Look at what they do. Yeah, correct. Anyway, we'll Very bring true. the caller back. I'm sure she disagrees, but <laughs> that's what <laughs> I right. believe. Caller, you're back uh, with us. <laughs> Um, go ahead. Go ahead with your second question. Did we lose the caller? Eight six two, caller. Uh, she is not back yet. What we'll do is we'll go to right. another call and then we'll come back to her, um, and yeah. hopefully she'll be there. We're going to go to your neck of the woods area. Hey, it'd be an three. interesting question to ask Pat, Pastor Langford the next time you have him on, or Steve Quayle, yeah. or anybody else. I still. I still don't understand that, you know, I used to not believe the once saved, always saved. It rubbed me the wrong way because mm-hmm. it gave me the idea that people felt that they could be saved and then their faith could be secondary or something that was, uh, you know, set aside as they had no worry uh, and were content that they were going to be fine no matter what. And um, that, that's why I had a problem we can with back, it. We can backslide, Joe. We can backslide. We can fall. Yes. We can fall into sin. But again, there's a difference between justification and sanctification. The sanctification process is different for, 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 for people. Even Paul suffered from the, the thorn in the flesh. All the great men and women of the Bible the, you know, you know, were still entangled in some sort of sin. But I would like to believe that it's, you know, the Bible is very clear that it is by grace through faith in Christ alone that we are saved, and that when we come to faith, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, forgiven of all of our sins, washed clean, not by anything that we've done, but by the propitiating work on the cross of the blood of the Lamb, Yeshua himself, that covers us, and God sees us from that point forward as totally righteous. He, we're declared righteous. We uh, are not under the law. And we, he, has become our, he has paid our ransom once and for all. We are free. And in the words of Martin Luther King, and by the way, Alveda King endorsed the book as well, Martin Luther King's niece, free yeah, at last, awesome. free at last, free at last. Go ahead. That's awesome. Um, all right, we're going to go to area code 303. Thanks for holding. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report with Greg Jackson. Yeah, hi, Greg and uh, Joe. How you doing? This is Bill from Good. Colorado. Hey, Bill. Hey, hey uh, Bill. Isn't, this, uh, isn't Rosh Hashanah the Feast of the Trumpets? Um, yes, the New, I believe it, Jewish I, New Year's Eve is is mm-hmm. tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Yes. No, actually, it starts at uh, sunset today. Well, right? sundown tonight. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have a uh, a trumpet to blow for the feast of the trumpets. Okay. So, awesome. I love it. Was that a shofar or a trumpet? Uh, that was a shofar. Um, and that's basically all I wanted to say. And uh, thank you all for uh, a great show tonight. And, uh, Greg, uh, God bless you and your book. And uh, you all have a great evening. Thank, thank you. you I appreciate it. And then, hey, you know, it's interesting that Bill Brink. Oh, there are I'm different sorry. person uh, with a trumpet or shofar that has sounded well, it off during our show, well, and I think that's awesome. 
Well, I love it because as a Jewish believer, I think this gives me a good opportunity just to talk about that for a minute. Um, Rosh Hashanah, which is <clears throat> the Jewish New Year, is called the Feast of Trumpets, right, in the Bible, because essentially it be- begins the Jewish High Holy Days um, and Ten Days of Repentance um, with the blowing of the ram's horn. or uh, I think the caller, just, Bill, just blew a sh- trumpet, but the shofar, and I know that you have a caller from Northern California who blows his shofar, and I always love it when he comes on your show, calling God's people together to repent from their sins. Mm-hmm. Um, and essentially during Rosh Hashanah, for people who aren't familiar, um, you know, in synagogue services, the, the trumpet traditionally sounds a hundred notes, and I don't know how many Bill just played, but it traditionally sounds a hundred notes, and it's the start of the, the civil year in, in Israel. And essentially it's, it's, a, it's a very solemn day where Jewish people are supposed to do a lot of soul-searching, forgiveness and, and, and remembering God's judgment as, but as well it's a day for celebration and looking forward to God's goodness and mercy in the new year um, and it's celebrated traditionally in the, the I think the, the first day of the Hebrew month which is Tishri in, which falls in either September or October I'm, I'm not really sure and if you go to Leviticus Chapter 23, it's mentioned, and also in Numbers 29. But I think the what's great, and for any of my uh, of your Jewish listeners out there, um, and by the way, um, the, the 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 solemnizations continue, and they call come in Yom Kippur, which is also known as the 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 Day of of Atonement. And what's amazing about Rosh Hashanah. And the, the High Holy Days, if, if, and I'm sure a lot of our Christian listeners understand um, that um, you know Rosh, Rosh Hashanah is also known as the Day of Judgment. And at the final judgment that's spoken of in Revelation 20, we read that anyone whose name was not found recorded in the Book of Life was thrown into the Lake of Fire. And the Book of Re- Revelation also speaks of this book of life is belonging to the Lamb, Jesus Christ, which is, of course, the Jewish Messiah, the Savior of the world. And so I think it's interesting, and and it's a great opportunity to talk about it, because the New Testament reveals in John 5 that the Father has given his Son, Jesus, authority to judge everyone. And in 2 Timothy um, 4, uh, Jesus, uh, it says that Jesus will judge the living and the dead. Jesus told his followers in John John 5, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me will have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death to life. By the way, that goes back to the previous caller. Jesus is saying, if you put your, your faith in me, you will never be condemned for your sins. They will have passed from death to life. Therefore, through our acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice and atonement for sin, Jesus, here's the good news, guys, has become the fulfillment of this Old Testament feast so closely associated with repentance and judgment. So tonight, as we enter into Rosh Hashanah and we talk about if there are any who are not saved, who are uh, repenting of their sins and who are soul-searching, today is your lucky day. (laughs) And I don't believe in luck, but today is the day of salvation, as, as the Bible says. You don't have to... Um, you can be forgiven now for eternity and, and have 100% assurance that if, God forbid, you die today, that you uh, will spend eternity forever in heaven with the Lord Jesus and that you can be washed of your sins right now. This doesn't, you don't need to you know, repent every year at the synagogue uh, to be forgiven. You can be cleansed by receiving Messiah Yeshua Jesus himself, and being covered by his blood because he is our Passover lamb, our sacrificial lamb that was slain on Calvary that died 2,000 years ago uh, as the, as the, the lamb, the, the silent lamb who went silently to his death but who is soon to return as the roaring lion of Judah who will come and who will have that sword of God's word in his mouth and who will, who will destroy all the wicked and the evil ones who are against him 
and who will reward those who are in in the in the Lamb's Book of Life. So it's a it's I think this is Rosh Hashanah is just a reminder, and we should be thankful as of Christians who are saved that we don't we don't if we're saved we're not under judgment anymore. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are saved by the blood of the Lamb once and forever sealed by the Holy Spirit with the promise of eternal salvation. He is our blessed hope by His work alone and praise God for that great truth. Hmm. So well said. Amen, Greg. Moving along here, we're going to go to area code 520. 520, you're up next. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report with Greg Jackson. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we Hello? can. Perfect. Thanks, Welcome. Joe. Another great evening. Uh, definitely keeping your dad in the prayers. Um, if he's Thank that you. sick, um, man, that's he must be a... Somebody punched his ticket. Um, Mr. Jackson, excellent work with your book. Um, if there are grandparents listening, uh, guys, you need to get this. Um, one for your children and and, and one for somebody else. Um, this stuff is, there's these lessons that, that just need to be taught uh, that are not being taught, right? Um, my my mm. comment is, is a little bit different. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, two things. One, I think God has put us at, at this place in time for a purpose and a reason. Uh, we, can, we can sit there and we can debate whether uh, what, what we're listening is true or not or genuine, and, and that's where we really got to ask and get on our knees, guys, and, and ask for the Holy Spirit. So, so the first thing Amen. that I'm going to preface, uh, preface everything that I'm saying is, one, we, we've got to be humble. We have to humble ourselves. Um, it's very easy to get puffed up and to get proud and to, to let your preconceived notions take, take a, a hold of, of you. Um, and, and what I'm getting at is this. One, uh, a couple days ago, let me actually rewind the tape a little bit further than that. Uh, several months back, um, I had seen a video about uh, a brother from Puerto Rico, um, Efrain Rodriguez, and then Steve Quayle happens to post um, one of his on his on his videos um, about this gentleman. Um, if anybody out in the listening audience from the Hagman Hagman guys, if you haven't listened to this, I ask you to please, um, you know, again take a, a, a dose of of the Holy Spirit and and let your ears. Uh, you know, perk up and listen to this. Um, uh, and I think it, it kind of precipitates what we were talking, I'm sorry, what y'all guys were talking about earlier about how we're going down this road and um, I think we can teach certain lessons, uh, again, down the road. But at the same time, though, there are events that are happening. Call it the Shemitah next year. Call it what we were talking about a second ago, uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, right, Mr. Jackson? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so so I think Hashanah there Shabbat. are events. Yeah. Um, call it, um, you know, the difference, the Kairos, uh, or Kairos, right, the God appointed time, and, you know, the Kronos, right, the, the, the time as in succession of time. Uh, what I'm getting at is this. There, there are some interesting things going on. Um, I, if, if you get a chance to watch it, he, uh, he talks about a meteor, um, and it's just, it's kind of interesting. It, it, I get the feeling that it, it has God's hand all over it. Um, one, two, there's another video accompanied by, I'm not sure if, Again, any of the listeners are, are aware of this by Prophecy Club, where he actually delineates um, not just one, but things from uh, Mr. I think of Mrs. Baldea, who is uh, Dimitri, uh, Dimitri Dudeman's daughter. Uh, things from Augusto Perez about how all these other people have have said these things of, of events that are coming. Uh, my only thing is, guys, uh, as Christians, and, and hopefully we step up and, and and be watchmen and let other people know. Your thoughts, guys? Well, yeah. I, I first of all, you're right on. We need to be, you know, very humble. Obviously, we need to, you know, debate, uh, you know, and and defend doctrine and 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 um, you know, be in defense of sound doctrine, um, especially in this age of deception where false doctrine is running rampant. But I think you're right. I mean, and and it needs, you know, I remind myself of this. My biggest thing in my in my life has been the ego and the Lord has had to deal with me on a number of occasions. Um, 
you know, and I, I just think it is important that, that when we do talk to each other about these issues and, you know, I'm passionate, to be honest with you, caller, <laughs> about the once saved, always saved, because I think that it really, you know, uh, causes a lot of fear and distress and anxiety among believers when they're told that they can lose their salvation. Um, and, and, and I believe that, um, you know, if we, love our, if we love our brothers, if we love our neighbor as ourselves, we'll want them to know the truth about what the Word says. And I believe that God is explicitly clear that um, when we place our faith in the Lord Jesus, you know, repent of our sins and place our faith in Him, that, that, um, that we are saved, sealed by the Holy Spirit once and for all. The judgment has been paid, the, 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 um, uh, or not the judgment, that, that the, um, the, the sacrifice has, has been made and that the ransom has been paid. And, you know, I, I just see a lot, especially my Roman Catholic friends that, that I know are anxious because they think they're going to go to, per, they have to go to perdition, uh, that they, they're not quite sure if they're saved, they're saved today, and then they do something bad, and then they're not saved, and they're saved, and they're unsaved, and it's like this schizophrenic behavior, and which I think I'd is like totally to, unbiblical. I'd like to on something real quick in regards to that. Um, I, I'm going to go back to, um, again, Joe, you're doing a great job. Solo, great job. Keep up the good work, right? Um, but Thank you. I, I will say that um, about Derek Prince, um, kind of alluding to a couple of things about Steve Coyle, how he's mentioned things about how, um, I guess, kind of giving out some of the tools that helped him out. I think he's a, a really good man of God. Uh, but one of the, the things about a teaching from uh, Derek Prince um, and you can find all this on YouTube, he mentions that just like a baby when they're born prematurely, how many people does it take to take care of those, you know, a child like that? And how many Christians are, are I kind of equate that to, now how many Christians are legitimately born on time? You know, we can't, going back to the karyos and chronos, we might want to do it again on our time, but was it God's time? Were you actually truly saved? Um, and that's part of that that looking at yourself in the mirror, which is really hard to do from a, a humanistic point of view, but um, it's when we can, you know, take that gulp and humble ourselves and look at ourselves in the mirror. Sure. Um, I think we can, we can definitely, uh, uh, hopefully, with, with a good attitude, um, you know, see what God has put us on the earth and, and to be, um, you know, who He put us on the earth to be. Guys, my daughter who I was about to come Amen. home from soccer practice. I just made some caramel uh, salt uh, popcorn that I'm going to enjoy. But God <laughs> loves y'all. Bless y'all. <laughs> Joe, it, um, it's Sam in Tucson again. Love you, man. Take care, guys. Uh, Love you too, Bye. Sam. Thanks for the call. All God right, bless Sam. you. God bless you, brother. Some great calls. Good yeah, call. and uh, you know, getting back to the one saved, always saved thing. Uh, well, the biggest thing that bothers me is I uh, about that is you know people will tr- uh, feel that they are no matter what they do that they're always saved and that level of assurity and, and comfort doesn't sit right with me in the, in the sense that, I mean, I, I hope that's the case. I wish that's the case, but it would, in my mind, knowing how my, my human nature and my mind works would, that would give me a justification to do things I shouldn't do. I, I guess that is the best way to put it. Um, I can see how that would play out in my mind, and and I guess that's one of the reasons that I I would ha- I have a an issue with with saying that and understanding that I always want to continue to strive to to do the best I can. I don't ever want to think that well, you know, I don't have to do this today because you know whether I do it or not, I'm I'm still saved, and you know it, that that's the the issue that um, sticks in my mind is what people will justify uh, behaviors and and thoughts and the way they'll let different things slide because of the the feeling of comfort they have of, oh, it doesn't matter because I'm still saved, um, if that made sense. Well, yeah, I think, it, I think you know, we can go back to the same, you know, issue, which is yeah. that you know, were, they, were you saved in the first place? I believe that when, when, when we get saved, which is a sovereign work of the Lord, um, not by works, lest any man should boast, but but by grace through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we're saved, that we're justified. That He gives us that ability; He becomes our righteousness. So Him residing in our hearts, it, His righteousness enables us through His Holy Spirit enables us 
to change our desires, which is exactly what I shared with your audience happened to me and I know happened to you. And you, I think your father has a similar testimony and I'm sure a lot of other listeners have the same testimony. He gives us that faith to continue and, and, and he gives us those desires that at least when we do sin, uh, we, you know, we acknowledge it, we recognize it, and we don't want to. I think one of the signs of a mature believer who's truly saved is that when they, when they do sin, they, they're, they're saddened, they're grief-stricken over it. They're, you know, they, they, they know yeah. that it's wrong. With a, now, yeah. with, a, with a false convert, um, you know, that, you know, think that because they got a little water sprinkled on their head when they were a kid or be just because they go to church on, you know, Christmas and Easter that they're that they're going to heaven, you know, they don't have that same brokenness over sin in their lives and the lives of their loved ones, I believe, because tragically, sadly, a lot of them are false converts. They were never saved in the first place because they never repented of their sins authentically, <coughs> placed their faith in the Lord Jesus, and were never born again in the first place. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And one thing I know that is true with me and never was before, but as I grow, uh, it continues to grow the same way as uh, when I sin and I know I sin, like you said, mm-hmm. the the uh, anguish, the, the spiritual uh, grief, it's overwhelming at times. It's, it's almost like it could be... Uh, you know, like how they say stress affects your your health. Well, the 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 sin and being knowing that I've sinned, it, it affects my mental health. It it makes me feel, uh, you know, terrible, dirty. It makes me uh, never want to do it again. And that's not something, as I said, that you know I've learned or, or was I did myself. This is something that the Lord does. It, it, he, it's a conviction. Um, and he's trying to to mold us. He's trying to, uh, as a his example is as a potter, uh, you know, working clay. He's trying to purify us and, and work us into a vessel of for him. And you know, I think it's so important that that anguish, that that those feelings are there. Otherwise, what would we have to be able to correct ourselves? How would we know that what we were doing was so wrong or so bad? And the Holy Spirit dwells within us and therefore is uh, with us at all times. So, you know, um, we have to understand and, that. Yeah, can convince us of our sin. I mean, in First John yeah. it says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So the fact that you recognize your sin and you're broken over it, the Bible says, what pleases God but a contrite heart and a broken spirit. So... Will we continue to sin? Of course we will for the rest of our lives. Hopefully less and less as we mature spiritually, we'll become more sanctified, more Christ-like in our thoughts, deeds, and actions. The fact of the matter is we're going to sin. We're go- the old man is still in us, and, and Paul dealt with this and wrote about this extensively in the epistles. This is a struggle that the great apostle Paul went through. We're going to go through it too. But one thing that Paul knew and I, I and I read it earlier, was that one thing he was assured of was that he was saved. He was assured of his salvation. Now, if Paul can be assured of his salvation, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, Paul wrote, then we should be too. We can have that same assurance, and we should have that same assurance, because he is our blessed hope. He's the hope of Israel. He's the hope of, of all sinners who have repented of their sins on this day of Rosh Hashanah, right? As we examine ourselves and our sins, those, whether you're Jew or Gentile, if you have not placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not asked him to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation for you. And I would encourage you, I would say right now, don't wait any longer Uh, because you don't need to live under guilt or condemnation or shame. All of your sin can be removed, and you can be made righteous through his righteousness and his atoning sacrifice that he made at Calvary 2,000 years ago. You can become a born-again believer in Jesus. You can be a new creation. You can have a... I always joke to people, Joe, that I had a heart transplant in 2001. Well, that's what happened to me. He gave me a new heart, a circumcised heart. Yeah. 
And we can't live in that guilt and conviction because that hinders our spiritual no. growth. And it's, yeah, and you know, it's, the Lord... it's natural to. It, yeah. Right. And it, we need to it's be natural focused to, but on... The, the, the the point is that a true mark of a, a a true believer is that when we do sin, we acknowledge it and we're broken over it, and we you know we 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 repent uh, you know and and uh, we and get we right back on from. track. Yeah. yeah, that's all. You know, my wife right. wrongs me, and she repents. I don't go immediately to divorce her. <laughs> There's only one unpardonable sin. Joe in the Bible, and that is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's rejecting Jesus. Other than that, I don't care whether you're a murderer like David. I don't care whether you're a blasphemer. I don't care whether uh, you are an adulterer. I don't care what your sin is. You've had an abortion. You've engaged in homosexual behavior. It doesn't matter what the sin is. The blood of Jesus covers it all. All that is required of us is for us to acknowledge that our sin separates us from a holy and righteous God and that to, ha- to be in relationship with him, that we need to call on the name of the Lord Jesus and we will be saved. And that Amen? speaks to the abundance of mercy, love that the Lord has for us because he does not yes. want to see anybody go to hell. He does not want to see anybody suffer no. in eternity. He wants us to receive that free gift of salvation and it wasn't conditional, meaning, you know, only if you committed these sins these many times or that many times. It was that, you know, all who had a pure heart and believed through faith uh, whole, wholeheartedly with the, you know, carrying out your life with the only agenda is to help other people and to strive to be better for the Lord. That's what he cares about. Um, and and that is, you know. That we would have a heart inclined to him, toward him. Yeah, that our hearts would be inclined toward Him, and that took me a long time to reconcile uh, in my own mind, and uh, I wish I would have understood yeah. you, a little bit. Joe, sooner you already because, have the victory, bro. Yeah, yeah, we we already have the victory. We've already won. He's won. He's our righteousness. We're saved. He saved us, <laughs> and we're going to heaven. We just have to and walk it out. Nobody's going to tell me differently. If Paul know it, if Paul knew it, I can know it too. Go ahead. Amen. Let's get to another call here. We're going to go to area code. 727. 727, you're up next. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Hi. Oh, what a wonderful message today. I'll tell you, I haven't heard it since the day I got saved in the church I got saved. And I was saved on Praise Ephesians God. 2, 8, 9. By grace are you saved through faith. And... Um, uh, Jesus um, minus nothing plus nothing, Jesus alone. And, um, yeah. you know, um, the Bible tells us specifically to rightly divide the word of truth. And uh, why should we do that? And the reason is because right believing produces right living. And I find mm. that I I work with a lot of people and... People in the church are so confused, and um, they don't go to the scriptures. They just fight you on something. And uh, and I I've looked at both ways. I was willing to say, well, let me look at what they're looking at. And um, but uh, and also that scripture you you used was in Ephesians um, four thirty. Um, mm-hmm. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And I don't think there's too much better scripture than um, John mm. three sixteen. For by um, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should never perish, but have eternal life. Amen. So. Thank you so much, so much. I pray that that book goes mightily. Everybody needs that book. And I wasn't going to listen tonight because I thought, well, that's for the younger people. But to (laughs) to see the the sharpness of the truth that you put in that book, uh, it's, it's just, it's one of a kind, and I pray that it goes forth. And thank you so much. Have a good night. Oh, what, Bye. What an what an encouragement. What a blessing. I'm tell, Joe, Absolutely. I'm just why I say you, we just do callers for all three hours. 
Oh man, you know we could do whole shows of just callers, and you know awesome call. never, Phenomenal. never disappoint. She's right. We're gonna go yeah. to Nothing Washington to State area code two five three. I believe this is Jack. I hope uh, he's Nothing he's near the phone there. Jack. Oh, he might be taking a nap. <laughs> hey Joe. Hey, hey Joe. Greg. Hey hey Greg. Greg, God bless you, hey, brother. Jack. I just. I, you know, I just love was you, in there listening to you. I had to call I in. Love I love Jack. He's, he's like my favorite caller. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jack from Lakewood, Washington, you guys. I, <laughs> Great to hear from you, Jack. Man, Greg, you you just you just nailed it on the head there, brother. I just I, I appreciate it, and, and I was sitting here listening to you, and I said, you know, that is right. That's absolutely the truth. You know, uh when I rededicated myself to Christ back a year and a half ago, and, you know, and I noticed things in my life that just automatically were just gone from my life. My language cleaned up. Uh, a lot of things just that were in my life were no longer there no more, and I had no desire for it. And, mm. and you know, and then I had a couple of things that I thought, why well, I got victory over this, I got victory over that. And two months down the road, and boom! I'm I, I'm just I'm back at that for a second, you know. But but what I noticed that is how after the sin was completed in my mind, and they did that, how I felt, and and I was so sorry for it that that I I, I repented of the sin, but I knew that I you know I knew that. You know what I said to God, and I and it's repeated itself a few times. And I said, you know, this is a hurdle, you know. And you know what, God, Father, that you're going. I know that you're going to deliver me just like you deliver me from everything else. And I just got that hope. Mm. And 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 the word predestination has always been in my thought too. So, if you can uh, elaborate on that for me, if you want. <laughs> Yeah, no, what a, that's encouraging. Um, well, you know, I believe that, that uh, you know, the Bible teaches that, um, you know, we, um, you know, we're predestined, but that, you know, we still have volition. I'm not a Calvinist. Uh, yeah. And I, and, and I believe that the Bible teaches clearly that it's both, that we're, right. that, that we're, that, whom he predestined, he foreknew. The Bible says, um, because God is he 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 sees the 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 beginning and the present and the future all at once, right? So he knows exactly. the, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so, um, the but the the fact of the matter is that um, you hit on a very important point. You had, and I think it's in the Book of Jude. I'm looking for it right now. But you had a repentant heart that leads to salvation, and and the Bible talks about it distinguishes between um, repentant, like worldly repentance or worldly sorrow that that's it, worldly sorrow that leads to uh, 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 that 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 is the sorrow of the world. Uh, but then there's a there's a godly repentance that leadeth unto salvation, and there's a big difference. There, there's a lot of people who are they're sorry, but they're not sorry because they're hurting God. They're sorry because they're sorrowful because they know what they're doing is wrong, or they know that. It, but it's it's not a it's not a recognition that they're sorrow because they they know that they're in rebellion to God that they're hurting their cre- they're, they're they're hurting their creator. I don't know if I'm doing a good job of explaining it, but what uh, the mark of a, a true Christian is that we have sorrow that leads us unto repentance and it's godly sorrow that leads yeah. to godly repentance and that's really Amen. really important. Yeah. Because we, I, because really we know that we're hurting God. It's like, you know, I tell my son when he gets in trouble and he doesn't really get in that much trouble but when he does i say look we're going to pray because you know i'm just your earthly father but your heavenly father i mean this is what i want him to know which is that you know when we sin we hurt others and you including our family members and our friends but but mostly we're sinning against god most importantly and the true marco i think of a true born again believer is that we have that recognition that we've sinned against god 
Amen. You know, which is a good yeah. thing. And he's given that. He's in, he's given you that. That's why you said your 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 language cleaned up. Hey, guess what, Jack? So did mine. Every word, yeah. every sentence had started with an F or an S word. You right. had one included. And it, yeah, and it and it went away. And people said, "Greg, you don't swear anymore, or whatever." And and uh, I just said, "Well, it's it's the work of the Holy. It's the work of the Lord. He just he cleaned me up." You know, and if we would just humbly submit ourselves, he will do the work. It's like most people believe, Jack, i got to get cleaned up before i got to get rid of this habit and that habit before I become a Christian. Or I no. Don't, but no, it, he'll take you, just he'll take you as you are. Just come yeah. to him. That's what he did for me, Amen. man. He just yeah. took all that stuff out of me and, and cleaned me up, shook me off, and, and dusted me up. And and it was just, it was just, it, it, it just, it came automatically like, and it's like, Mm. You know, I knew I was there. I knew that I knew that 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 the Holy Spirit was in my life, and that that Christ was reigning in my life. And I could I could uh, man, I'm about to start to cry. And uh, yeah, and he loves you. He just no, you know that you know, and and you try and tell that to people that you care and you love, and and they just reject you and they don't want to hear it, and and. Uh, and uh, I have people that don't even call me no more, you know, but I really love them and pray about them. Well, Jack, they, you know, we've had the, the opportunity and the, and the fortune to be able to, to have conversations off air. And, uh, you know, you, you're a person who has uh, a heart of gold, and you want I know you want nothing more than, than to, to help people, not to be, you know, you don't tell people these things to, to so they think you're right. You do this for uh saving souls and leading lives to Jesus Christ and it does hurt when when you know uh people not only don't believe you dismiss you but uh continue to uh you know cut off contact but you know you you did what you could and and this is the lord doing what he has to do for whatever purpose he has and you never know uh you know you could see these people in heaven one day and 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 they'll have to say thank you to you because those seeds you planted uh were watered by the lord but you know just remember uh, never to be discouraged when when you're doing the right thing for god and i and i know yeah. uh you've come a long way and and you've helped me with some things and and we need this fellowship yeah we do hey, and, and I, I, yeah yeah well, i was Greg. just going to say you're in good you're in good company because yeah, I know I am. I, I just I love this show, man. I just I just no, I'm ta- I just I'm ta- can't I'm wait talking to about be the here. apostle. I'm talking about the apostle Paul. He says at the end of Second Timothy, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. In the Around future, the there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous Judge will award to me on the day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. And Jack, I know one thing about you, brother. You are going to love his appearing. You are going to love to see him. And he is going to look at you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Just keep loving the Lord, loving others, sharing the gospel as as the Holy Spirit gives you the opportunity to. And guess what? Yeah. You're going to have a a heck of a reunion up in heaven with all those people that you prayed for and loved on. Amen. So keep fighting the good fight. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, thanks Greg. Jack. Appreciate you. Okay. Love you, brother. God bless you. Love you too. Bye bye. Take care. Well, Greg, Man, that show will... is three hours done. Yeah, uh, you know, there's some shows that don't go fast like this, but this uh, this one and and you as a guest always, what it goes blessing. by so fast, and it, it has been a blessing. I think we've covered a lot of ground tonight, and you did a fantastic job. And I want to thank you, and and we're definitely going to have to do this again sooner than later. You're always welcome on this show, and uh, yeah, we can't thank you enough, folks. His book, Ten Things to Teach Your Children Before You, or, sorry, Ten Things, Forty, 40 Things to Teach Your Children Before You hey, Die. Hey, don't shortchange me, man. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, maybe we can do part two, forty more after this one. But yeah, it's a great tool. Uh, you know, you send us an email if you can't afford one and you'd like to have one. Send us an yep. email at I'll studio. Send you at Hagman and Hagman, uh, or Joe Hagman at Hagman and Hagman dot com, and we'll make sure we get one out to you, uh, Greg. It's uh, end of the show. I want to thank you again, and God bless you yep. and all that you do. Uh, we'll talk to you again soon. 
I appreciate it, and God bless to you, you and, and your entire audience. And uh, if anybody wants to uh, email me, you can go to you can just email me Greg Two Gs dot Jackson at gmail dot com. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, Doug, get better if you're listening. You're you're in all of our thoughts and prayers. I love you guys. We love you too, Greg. God bless you. All right, that'll do it for us tonight. Until tomorrow, stay safe. God bless. Have a great evening. Thank you so much for tuning in.